Thank you for your patience, members. Chair, we're now live on YouTube. When you're ready, would you like to start the meeting? Thanks very much, Wendy. So good, good afternoon and welcome to East Devon District Council's Virtual Strategic Planning Committee meeting on the 8th of March 2022. Uh, I'm your chair, Councillor Dan Ledger, based on the decision of the council to continue virtual meetings until the 11th of May, uh, I'd like to remind both members of the public attending or watching that the council has delegated much of its decision uh, making um, powers to our senior officers. We'll continue to adhere as closely as possible to the procedural rules detailed in our constitution. In the event in a break in the internet connection uh, or a power cut, please bear with us as we try and reconnect. After 15 minutes, if we're unable to reconnect, we'll consider this meeting adjourned and reconvened at a later date. I am actually struggling with my internet connection this morning. So if my internet does go down at any point, I'll defer to, to my vice chair, vice chair, Councillor Davey. Um, so if you wish for any, uh, to make a comment, please raise your electronic blue hands and wait to be called. Uh, any member of the public can view the agenda by visiting our website, east7.gov.uk. Before I start the meeting, I'd like to welcome Councillor Richard Lawrence uh, to the committee. Um, he joins the committee, uh, replacing Councillor Bonetto, who's left us to join uh, Overview and Scrutiny Committee. Uh, so I'd like to also thank Councillor Bonetta for his contributions in the time that he's been on the committee. So we'll now start the meeting by doing a roll call of all committee members here present. And it's over to you, Wendy, please. Thank you, Councillor Ledger. Present, thank you. Councillor Davy. Present, thank you. Councillor Allen. Yes, I'm here, Wendy, thank you. Thank you. Councillor Arnott. I have seen him. Councillor Arnott. I think he's muted. I'll come back. Councillor Bailey. Present. Thank you. Councillor Blakey. Present, Wendy, thanks. Thank you. Councillor Hayward. Um, yeah, I, I am present. Um, if I might, through, through you, Wendy, into the chair, um, I'm manning uh, the desk at the moment, so I might have to come and go, Chair. My apologies. Thank you. Councillor Howe. Present, thank you. Thank you. Councillor Ingham. Present. Thank you. Councillor Lawrence. Present, thank you, Wendy. Thank you. Councillor Moulding. Present. Thank you. Councillor Pratt. Present, thank you, Wendy. Thank you, Councillor Skinner. Present, thanks. And Councillor Arnott. He think... was in the meeting, but he seems to have left. Okay, might have um, connection issues. Okay, back to you, Chair. We are caught for this afternoon's meeting. Thank you very much, Wendy. So we start with public speaking. And uh, the first, we've got two members of the public wishing to speak. The first uh, is Mr. Andrew Preston. Uh, over to you, Mr. Preston. You have three minutes whenever you're ready. Hey, Chairman. Uh, I'm speaking on behalf of Mr. Peter Stodgell, who owns land at Manor Green Up Ottery, and he would like to support the proposal that members agreed at the February meeting, which was to include more villages within tier four of the settlement hierarchy. Up Ottery was specifically mentioned as a settlement that should be considered in this respect. The officer has advised that Up Ottery was omitted from the tier four list as the village lacks a shop. However, by other measures set out in the role and function of settlements document, Up Ottery ranks highly in relation to many of the 23 settlements already within tier four. Up Ottery has an overall population of 699, 10 out of the identified tier four settlements have smaller populations. Up Ottery has a working age population, 516, with 73% of those being economically active. 13 out of the 23 identified tier four settlements have a smaller working age population. In terms of jobs, Up Ottery is a net importer of labour, with 145 local jobs fulfilled by people travelling in from outside the parish. Of the 23 identified tier four settlements, 18 of these have fewer jobs. Up Ottery is also one of the very few villages in the area offering ultra-fast broadband, beneficial to those working in the village in particular, the growing numbers working from home. Up Ottery isn't blessed with a wide range of local services, but it does have a primary school, community hall, pub, 
sports field, play area and bus service. The role and function of settlements document shows that four of the other identified tier four settlements have equal or fewer services in comparison to the lottery. The village is therefore sustainable with a reasonable range of local services, good employment provision and a good sized population also serving the wider rural hinterland and compares favorably in many respects with some of the settlements already identified in tier four. Geographically, the northeastern part of East Devon is underprovided for with designated local planned settlements, with only Dunkerswell and Broad Hembury in that general area. As noted, Chairman, a pottery does not have a shop, but surely one way to encourage new service provision is to enable some modest growth in the community. A pottery has opportunities for limited sustainable development, not least at Manor Green, where my client, Mr. Stodgill, owns a plot with obvious potential for around five modest homes and which the parish council and councillor Key have previously been keen to see developed. I asked the committee to please include our pottery as a tier four settlement and to consider land at Managree as a potential housing allocation. Thank you. Your three minutes, Mr. Preston, thank you. Thank you very much. Bang on three minutes. Um, we will. I'm sure that the committee will take in on board your comments when we come to that agenda item. Um, we now move to Councillor Roger Giles. Um, Roger, whenever you're ready, you have three minutes. Right, Chairman. Thank you again for again allowing me to address you about the East Devon Local Plan on, on behalf of Old Street Mary Town Council. Um, and a warning: lest I'm causing alarm by speaking again, I can assure you that it is certainly not my intention to be addressing you all at, at all of your committee meetings. But I was only allowed three minutes, which was insufficient time at the last meeting to make all the points I wish to. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank Mike Allen, Mike Howe and Ben Ingham for agreeing with me on the 22nd February um, that 1,300 dwellings for offering was far too many. Uh, and at that meeting, Councillor Alistair Bruce strongly criticised proposals for 650 dwellings at Fenerton, which would have implications for Rothery. Should this become a reality, it would generate an additional 72 pupils for the King School in Rothery, which, as I said on the 22nd of February, is at capacity. Uh, Chairman, this afternoon I've got three points to make. The first one is about the neighbourhood plan. The proposal for 1,300 dwellings in Rothery and 470 in West Hill, runs counter to the Osprey St Mary and West Hill neighbourhood plan. The, the NP was consulted on very extensively. It was approved by EDDC and it was approved by the Government Planning Inspector. Very many other communities in East Devon have an adopted neighbourhood plan. In many cases, it seems to me they face a degree of house building, which is completely at odds with the, with the neighbourhood plan. To proceed with the house building proposals considered in your earlier meetings would effectively ride roughshod over the whole neighbourhood plan process in East Devon. Uh, my second point is about call for science. So on, on the 22nd of February, I said that parish and town councils are best placed to know about site availability and about site suitability. In your agenda today, the first point, availability, appears to have been taken on board but not the second point, suitability. It's my opinion that parish and town council should have a view on site suitability before the local um, consultation is issued, not afterwards. Uh, and my third point, um, and this is very much linked to the last one, but maybe somewhat more controversial. In my days on East Devon District Council, I complained about the Heller predecessor panel, it was called the Schla then, uh, being almost totally populated with representatives of building companies. Whilst representation of environmental or amenity groups or parish or town councils was minimal or even non-existent. Regrettably, I believe the same situation applies today. So my final plea to you, Chairman, is to ensure that you do not have a heller panel stuffed full of house builders who will presumably want the maximum number of sites to be allocated and built but rather a panel which is balanced, 
a balanced panel which will be aware of and take account of constraints. Thank you for listening, Chair. But before I mute myself, can I ask again, has the joint letter from West Hill Parish Council and Ottery St Mary Town Council been sent to all members of your strategic planning committee? And if it hasn't, why not, please? Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Councillor Charles. Just to answer, just cover a couple of your questions. With regards to towns and parish councils, they will have a chance to, to inform the plan uh, at the consultation stage. That is the whole point of us going out to consultation is so that uh, every member of the of the district, as well as towns and parishes, can feed into it. Um, and I know from the, the committee, when we do look at consultations, we do take those comments on board. Am I allowed um, to come back on that? <laughs> just bear with me in two seconds. With, with regards to the healer, we did invite um, multiple members from the likes of the Environment Agency, Natural England, uh, Heritage England, and, uh, well, I think multiple other organisations as well. Uh, regrettably, they did come back and say that um, they were not available at the time uh, and they could not get, they had no capacity to actually inform any of the HELAR process. Um, with regards to the HELAR, again, it's, it's, an, it's, it's about building up an evidence base. So it will be for this committee to decide um, site allocations when they come forward. It will not be for the HELAR panel to to, to decide any site that, that's actually put forward. Mr. Freeman, do you have anything you wish to, to add just to those responses? Uh, no, thank you, Chairman. I, I think that's covered. Thank you. Thank you. Roger, we've got 30 more seconds if you want to come back with anything just before. Yeah, so my strong opinion is that once the site is included in the consultation draft, it's too, it's too late. So if the, if the councillor has decided to take it out, the owner of the site, the developers, the agents, will, will say, well, you included it in the consultation draft. That was the professional view of the officers. Councillors have taken it out. So it's got considerable weight given to it by included in, in, the, um, in, in the draft consultation. So, so my plea is to do that kind of work beforehand and remove unsuitable sites. Otherwise, you're, you're going to have a great difficulty in... in, in not seeing it become reality eventually. I don't think we're not allocating any sites. It's just officer's opinion. Again, it's for the committee to decide what they put forward. And that's what gives it weight. Um, I think the way that we are doing it is the most open and transparent way that we've ever done. Uh, I think we've ever done a local plan. And it is about trying to get as much community engagement, like contributions from yourself today, Councillor Giles. Um, and for that, I, I do appreciate you, you coming to the committee. Councillor Ingham, you wish to come in? Uh, thank you, Chair. I'm afraid of my opinion. Roger's got a, got a, point, uh, a point there. Um, and I think the, the problem is that once you've opened Pandora's box, it's very difficult to stuff things back in there. However, uh, much you, you, you've given a, a sense of logic to it in that uh, sorry I just Council, councillors we aren't going to make this a whole public session of uh, eight different oh. councillors coming in at this point so Councillor Bailey, Councillor Allen we'll, we'll save it for the actual agenda itself um, we'll move on to agenda item two minutes of the previous meeting held on the 22nd of February does anyone have any comments they wish to make on those? Councillor Bailey. I'll save my comments for later. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Allen, is this to do with the minutes? It's to do with your previous comment that this is the most transparent ever, because I totally uh, think that the previous way we did it, which invited uh, councils um, parish councils and members of the public to individual meetings on particular topics was very much more transparent than this. Okay, very noted. Uh, we move back to the minutes. Does anyone have any comments? Sorry, sorry comments? Chair, I'd like to come back and finish. The point being that um, some of the sites that have been included have been um, uh, refused previously uh, through the planning application process. And these are huge sites. 
So including them again, I believe, is giving them uh, uh, the uh, people the very wrong message about what we're doing. OK, because uh, then there's other sites that haven't been considered, haven't had a planning application and they're not being considered. OK, so it's all very well saying you're being transparent, but you're also, I believe, can be misleading. Thank you. Thanks very much for that, Councillor. Um, it goes back to the, the same adage that I keep on making is that it's not down to officers. It's officers to recommend decisions to us. It's up to this committee on what goes and what's included in the local plan. All of you, as a collective committee, decide what sites are allocated in this local plan. It's up to you and what you wish to see come forward. Um, so vote however you wish. Um, we move on to agenda. Oh, sorry. We carry on with the minutes. I see no hands raised for regarding the minutes, so I'll take those as approved. We move on to uh, agenda item three, which is apologies. Um, Wendy, have we had any apologies? Yes, Councillor Rylance and Councillor Chamberlain. Thank you very much for that. Uh, so I'll take that they're all accepted. Uh, agenda item four is declarations of interest. Um, as, as the same as before, can you please indicate the agenda item, what type of interest it is uh, and why you're declaring it? So uh, we'll do that again via a roll call. So Wendy, over to you. Thank you, Chair. So can I start with you, please? None that I'm aware of at this time. Thank you. Councillor Davey? Yes, uh, this is a personal interest. I'm also an Exmouth town councillor, um, and I think that's relevant particularly to item eight, where we'll be looking at the settlement hierarchy. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Allen? None that I'm aware of, Wendy. Thank you. Councillor Arnott? Thanks, Wendy. Uh, to confirm I'm present and also to say personal interest agenda item eight, settlement hierarchy as a Collinson Parish Councillor. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Bailey. Um, I'd just like to make a personal de declaration as Devon County Councillor. That's for all items. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Blakey. Uh, yes, item eight, uh, personal interest as Cranbrook Town Councillor. Thank you. Councillor Hayward. I'll come back to Councillor Hayward. It looks like he is not available at the moment. Councillor Howe. Yeah, item eight and probably the others as well. Uh, I'm a personal interest on a parish councillor for Bishop's Cliff Parish Council. Thank you. Councillor Ingham. Present. De any declarations? Sorry, sorry. No declarations either. Sorry. Thank you. Councillor Lawrence. None that I'm aware of. Thank you, Wendy. Thank you. Councillor Moulding. None. Thank you. Councillor Pratt. And to my knowledge. Thank you. Councillor Skinner. Um, yeah, I have a personal interest with the Carter family, make that clear, which would be Greendale and Stewart's and Sons. Uh, if that comes up as a personal interest, I'll have a DPI, I think on, on to be fair, on agenda item eight, because it would talk about the settlement hierarchy and the village of which I live, uh, of which I have a land interest, uh, is could, could very well be involved in that. So I might ask through you, Chair, if you don't mind, that I um, uh, step out of agenda item eight. I think that's the proper thing to do. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so if I go back to Councillor Hayward, are you available? Okay, back to you, Chair. Thanks very much, Wendy. Uh, we'll come to Councillor Hayward when we see his, uh, his camera come back on. So we then move to matters of urgency, so I can confirm that there are no matters of urgency to be dealt with or discussed today. Uh, then moving on to confidential and exempt items again, I can confirm that there'll be no confidential and exempt items on today's agenda. Moving into the main agenda, agenda item seven is the new community and infrastructure provision, and it is over to Mr Ed Freeman to present your report. 
welcome to the meeting Ed and it's open to you please. Uh, thank you Chair. So um, this report follows on from members meeting on the 8th of February where members uh, resolved that they would like to receive a further report on the option of a new community for inclusion within the spatial strategy in the new working draft local plan uh, and in particular it's, it's provision of infrastructure alongside that new community. Um, this report has been prepared uh, effectively to signpost members to the various work and reports that have uh, come forward over the last few years in relation to new community proposals. Um, so it starts with um, the report in 2018 with regard to principles for accommodating the future growth needs of East Devon, uh, where the uh, potential for a new community and the constraints of the rest of the district in terms of delivering to the housing needs are likely to be needed in a new local plan were identified um, and members considered uh, a number of principles in relation to locating growth in the district, um, one of which was around a significant proportion of growth being accommodated in the western part of the district uh, and other principles like focusing development around main transport corridors etc. Um, since then there's been various work uh, ongoing reports brought through uh, either this committee or through cabinet with regard to uh, new community proposals, the Garden Communities um, initiative uh, and programme that we are part of um, and delivery vehicles. So you've got reports from October 2019 right the way through to uh, last year uh, with regard to delivery vehicles and, and options around uh, new community, uh, not to mention also work that was done under GASP um, that uh, was brought to members in 2020 as well and uh, some of the evidence produced at that time. Uh, I'm not uh, saying that this is by all means, uh, by any means, rather a, a comprehensive uh, development. There are obviously uh, uh, evidence, there are obviously holes in that evidence that we're currently working to fill to build up the evidence base uh, for consideration uh, of the draft plan later this year. Um, and so the report goes on to talk about some of the current work that's ongoing and future work that's coming forward through uh, a commission that's recently been uh, undertaken uh, with external consultants to help us in terms of that work. Um, so the second part of the report is summarising that work in terms of reviewing options uh, for, for a new community and considering the infrastructure requirements, so looking at transport infrastructure, energy infrastructure, green infrastructure, community infrastructure, um, and, and the basic services and facilities. So uh, picking up on issues that have been raised at previous meetings about drainage issues, uh, that would be all incorporated into that work which then goes on potentially to look at visioning of a new community and then master planning and delivery vehicles so that uh, that work's being prepared alongside uh, further discussions and work on the local plan uh, such that we have hopefully all of the evidence that's needed to make an informed decision when a final decision is, is needed later in the plan production process. Uh, so hopefully that's a useful report in terms of setting out the work that's been done so far, the work that is uh, being undertaken and will be undertaken in, in the future and how that sits with the local plan timetable. Uh, so in terms of the recommendations, members are asked to note those previous reports and the debates that have taken place in relation to them um, and uh, to consider further the, the principle of inclusion of a new community at this stage in terms of the spatial strategy of the working draft local plan. Uh, as I've said at previous meetings, I, I think it is a key part of the strategy um, and really having a clear steer from members at this stage that uh, we're hopefully heading in the right direction in terms of that work uh, would be really helpful in, in informing uh, our further work as, as we move forward uh, with production of the draft local plan. Thank you, Chair. Thanks very much for that, Ed. Um, we'll start with, for members outside of committee, and we'll start with Councillor Faithful. So over to you, Councillor Faithful. Thank you, Chair. Um, to me, this agenda item seven is completely in the wrong place. This, whether or not there should be a town, should be, I, you know, I sent a message out to all councillors back along my and I feel we should be working from the bottom up, starting, I mean, it's along the lines, I think, of what Councillor Giles was saying, getting in touch with parishes, communities, sorting out what the rural communities need, What because there's a distinct shortage of affordable homes in rural communities, and that will need a certain amount of houses out there. If we start from the bottom and work up, and then 
so that the new town is the last on the list. However many houses are needed, we'll sort out what is needed. Um, the other point for me, um, historically, towns, if you go right back into the history of the towns, they tend to be developed at river crossing points. And it's a community, it's a, like a central point where everyone travels and comes to this one point. The new towns don't work like that. It's more like a, a, a pile of houses stuck in a place that seems to sort of fit in with a certain pile of criteria. Um, a new town, a rural town, should be working with the surrounding villages, the surrounding communities, so that it's a central point for the, the surrounding villages. It's not just a, a plonk of houses out on its own right. Um, so that's where I think that the whole order, so to me, the order of agendas for this meeting is, to my mind, back to front. So I, I don't feel item seven should be discussed at this point. It should be down at the bottom um, after you've worked out the rest of what you, we want to do. Anyway, there you go. Thank you, Chair. Thanks very much for that, Councillor Faithful. We move then to Councillor Ingham, please. Thanks, Chair. Ed said that uh, the new town would be, uh, you know, one of the most important parts of the emerging local plan. I disagree. I believe it is the crucial, most important element of the emerging local plan. And I suggest to you, Chair, that many people on this committee also agree, because if we're going to hit our climate emergency strategy, we have to do this. What's so important, Chair, is that not only is what we decide regarding the new town absolutely critical, I believe it totally undermines the hierarchy that we have already had put in front of us. And what I object to, Chair, is we had one option. You either had a hierarchy or you didn't. Um, and that didn't really include or, or make strategic reference to this new town. And that's why I believe as we move forward, Chair, you will see that the new town becomes absolutely essential uh, to our emerging local plan. And we will have to revisit this hierarchy, because there will be absolutely no point in addressing climate change by putting houses right next to jobs and reducing commuting if at um, you know, 10 miles, 15 miles away from that site, you go and increase the size of Devon's biggest town. That would be dumb. Not an error, it would be a dumb thing to do. And we would be resented for it and laughed at over the years of people when they by people when they revisit what we've decided in 2022-2023. So we really have to be careful moving forward, Chair. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Ian. Councillor Bailey, over to you, please. Thank you. Um, my concern about the, so I agree that getting the new town right is absolutely essential. And my concern is about the timings. And I feel, I am concerned that we're behind with what we're doing with the new town. I hope we're not. Um, and I, I'm just not, there's a few things in the report that I'm just not quite clear about. So for instance, um, the garden communities program, it looks as though we're not going to be possibly getting any funding through that um, because of an absence of a commitment uh, to a proposal. So I'm concerned that that means that more will, may have to be funded through the taxpayer. So that's my first concern. Um, if my second concern relates to um, the delivery vehicle. Um, and the fact that money, £300,000, was put aside, I think, 
following the meeting on the 15th of December 2020, but I don't know what's happened since then um, and where we've got to. Um, and consultants have been now commissioned for work, but I, it's not clear to me precisely. I know it's, it's generally described what they're going to be doing, but it's, it's not precise in terms of when that's coming back. And what this is all leading me to be concerned about is are we going to be in a position? So if we go out to public consultation in September, um, are we going to be in a position to have everything that we need with regards to the new plan ready for that consultation document? Because I'm not convinced from this um, that, that we will be. Um, so um, I also am concerned about how this settlement would fit in with the hierarchy of settlements. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'll leave it at that for the moment. Thank you. Thanks very much. Ed, can I bring you in at this point? Um, and do you think you could just cover off, obviously, the report that Andy Wood brought to the last cabinet regarding um, the points you just raised by Councillor Bailey, please? Uh, yes, certainly, Chair. So, I mean, what's in the report are sort of the the headlines, if you like, for, from that commission. Um, don't see a problem in circulating the full brief, if that's helpful to members um, to have that. Um, but the intention is that this work programme of this commission is developed alongside the local plan. So we won't have all of this information by the time we come to consult on the draft plan. Um, I think we will certainly, or certainly the intention is that we have um, uh, item one on page 22, the review of the options, uh, so that we can uh, go out with a proposal or would intend to go out with a proposal at draft stage of, of which of the options for a new community is, is the favoured one, um, based on having all of that information about infrastructure that's needed um, and um, uh, for the assessment of, of each of the sites um, for, for, to inform that work. Um, but obviously, the further work in terms of delivery vehicles that Councillor Bailey refers to needs to stem from an understanding of which of the options is, is favoured and some initial work in terms of visioning and master planning of that, because you need to understand well, we need to understand what we're de delivering to then tailor the appropriate delivery vehicles to that. Um, so there's a lot of work that needs to be done before we can refine the delivery vehicles down to specific favoured options. Uh, but there is some initial work about delivery vehicles and the, and the potential options in the reports that have already been taken through to which there are hyperlinks within the report to do that. Um, so hopefully that gives a good context as to what the various options are likely to be. Um, but reaching a favoured option, as I say, stems from an understanding of what we're trying to deliver, uh, which option and what the vision for that place would be. Um, just picking up on uh, on some of the other points uh, that were raised in terms of the com garden communities program, we, we are in in the garden communities program. Uh, we, we haven't been receiving funding recently, um, but um, we are still in that program and could access funding once there is a clear proposal on the table uh, to take forward. Um, I believe the funding is allocated on an annual basis, so there would potentially be an opportunity in a year's time to to look to to tap back into that funding. Um, in terms of how a new community fits with the hierarchy, well, I think that comes back to, to what the vision for that place would be and, uh, and what members envisage it being, the size and scale of that place, uh, uh, and it would be assessed against the same criteria that we've used to establish the settlement hierarchy, um, but, but clearly until that place is built and established, I don't think it features in the settlement hierarchy or, or can do. You'll notice, uh, I think, some of our comments about, about Cranbrook within the settlement hierarchy are obviously caveated on the basis of services and facilities that are, are due to be delivered there in the, in the near future in terms of establishing its place in, in the hierarchy. So I think similarly, uh, it would be something that would uh, be kept under review. Uh, uh, and when we're reviewing the settlement hierarchy in future plans, uh, we, we can look at where it, where it would sit. But ultimately, you know, based on the scale that we're, we're talking about and services and facilities uh, I would envisage being needed for that, it's, it's going to sit quite highly in that hierarchy, potentially uh, tiers two or three, I would have thought. Thank you, Chair. 
Thank you very much for that, Ed. We then move to Councillor Allen, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, in uh, conjunction with several of the previous speakers, I don't think that we're in a position at this stage to see, uh, say that there will be certainly a new uh, town development as has been mooted. We don't actually have uh, any expectation from the consultant's report that there will be um, uh, a justification made other than on the basis that we have to fill in a certain number of homes for the government. Uh, secondly, we learn, and Ed Freeman has noted it, the findings from our 10 year review of what happened in Cranbrook. Now, and in amongst all of those, many recommendations, which we're not really taking into account in this discussion. One of the key ones was get the infrastructure right first and make sure you've got the right delivery vehicle. Um, therefore, thirdly, we haven't got the opportunity to understand the impact of the climate change on the flooding in the Clist Valley. If you look at the um, uh, if you look at the flow of different rivers in that area, if you look at what has happened in terms of flooding and, and overflow, I'm not sure that this is the right location anyway for a new town. We haven't properly considered whether or not the Axminster uh, town could be um, proposed with an upgraded way of finding the necessary money. We shouldn't, as Andrew Moulding has said, decide to take it out of the plan. Secondly, there is another proposal, which I've heard of, to build substantial new number of houses to the east of Honiton. Now, for all of those reasons, I may want to make a proposal that in terms of the recommendations, that number two should be changed to consider the inclusion of a new community as part of the spatial strategy within the working draft local plan. But I don't think we ought to commit to it blind. I don't think this is the right time to make a decision of that magnitude and to put it in the local plan on that basis. We need to get it right this time and I think we learned from enough from Cranbrook to realize this is not a case of jumping in feet first to make a commitment when you actually haven't got the infrastructure right. Thank you, Chair. That's my proposal Thanks. that we change to consider the inclusion of, we agree to consider the inclusion of a new community as part of the uh, spatial strategy. Completely happy with that, Councillor Allen. I, I think we're, we're arguing more over semantics there. It says in the, the recommendation, agree in principle. So it's no firm agreement. It's just agreeing that as uh, a committee, we agree to that we are in need of a new community. Yeah, I'm happy uh, to second Councillor Allen if that helps on that. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Arnott. Um, OK, we'll go back outside of uh, committee now. Councillor Young, I'll, I'll call you this once, but later agenda items, you need to come in at the start. Councillor Young, over to you. Thank you, Chair. Um, got a title of a new song here. Where have all the garden villages gone? Um, some time ago, we were discussing garden villages and we were discussing possibly two garden villages of say 4,000 dwellings each. And uh, we've now seem to be going for a, a town of 8,000 uh, dwellings. Um, would that town be classified as a garden community and therefore we could be able to get some funding? Um, that's my question. Thank you. 
Very much like Councillor Young. We'll go to Councillor Blakey and then we'll come to Ed again. So, Councillor Blakey, over to you. Thank you, Chair. Um, interesting comment from Councillor Faithful regarding um, ancient settlements being um, located on river crossings, which, of course, were the, the pinch points of their day, although those were many centuries ago. We're not encumbered by difficulties over getting over um, watercourses so much any longer. And um, I think it's certainly arguable that it's pretty undesirable to put new, new uh, developments, new, um, new villages or towns um, on the banks of rivers anyway. We, uh, we know full well what's happening with the climate and that um, it's, it's asking for trouble. Um, the pinch point now will be transport links. Um, said it before, but um, a proposed new town, particularly in the locations we're looking at, are going to have real trouble. Uh, there are no accessible rail links um, close to um, the, the proposed settlement. Um, it's going to be entirely road reliant. Um, the experience of Cranbrook, um, which let us not forget is not yet even halfway complete, um, will tell us that uh, mistakes can and will be made, even with the benefit of hindsight. Um, there, there will be mistakes in the future because there always are. Uh, we haven't yet delivered um, a town, a community in Cranbrook that's still many years away. And I, I think possibly the biggest question of all is um, will a town of the size that is being considered here, anything up to 8,000 homes, really be necessary? Um, the question remains over whether 900 new homes a year is, is really a realistic figure. Is, is the government algorithm um, sensible or is it, uh, is it skewed in some way? So. I think we should be um, very careful, to say the least, about even considering a new town when there are opportunities to expand other settlements uh, within the, the district and which is not going to create um, the mother of all um, transport problems, um, particularly in the, um, the, the Cliss Valley, the Cliss Mary area. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Councillor Blakey. Ed, can I bring you in again just to cover off the, the last few speakers, please? Uh, yes, thank you, Chair. Um, so uh, in terms of Councillor Young's uh, comments, uh, I mean, there are options in terms of potentially having a number of garden villages as opposed to, to one uh, larger uh, new community. I, I think one of the issues with that though fundamentally is the delivery of the infrastructure to support that. Uh, obviously one of the experiences we found with Cranbrook is, is that you need a certain critical mass fundamentally for the market to deliver uh, some of the services and facilities, particularly as we found the Cranbrook Town Centre, um, to, to make that viable. Um, and so the more um, sort of fragmented the housing numbers are into a number of smaller communities the harder that will be to deliver those services and, and facilities and potentially the more uh, cost is incurred in terms of opening up those sites and delivering services and facilities and infrastructure to them um, so that's kind of where I think the uh, idea of, of a town rather than a series of villages has, has come from. Um, but, you know, that's open for further expl exploration, I think, through the consultants' uh, work that's being commissioned in assessing the options, because obviously the options are of different sizes and scales. Um, so that will be part of, of that assessment. Um, I don't think that the, the size and scale necessarily matters too much in terms of the garden communities program. Uh, that's more about the principles of applying garden community principles. So um, mentioned in the report about um, East Devon being part of that program alongside um, Exeter. The, the Exeter sites are, are the Livable Exeter programme sites. Um, so they've accepted those as being within the Garden Communities programme. So I think uh, regardless of, of, of uh, the scale of individual communities uh, within East Devon, I, I think we're safe there. It's about being clear about what the council is looking to promote so that we can tap into that, that uh, resource, both in terms of funding, but also the experience and knowledge uh, that sits within that, that programme and other parties within that programme to help us to develop our proposals and move that forward. Um, in terms of Councillor Blakey's comments, um, 
in terms of need, um, I mean, what we're talking about is potentially a new community proposal that brings forward 2,500 homes in this plan period. The 8,000 is talking about really the, the, the sort of scale, the total scale of a new community. Uh, coming back to this issue about delivering services and facilities and sort of scale that I think is, is needed to deliver that. And I, I think that stems back to one of the learning points from Cranbrook being that uh, we weren't clear really from the outset the total scale of, of Cranbrook. I think, um, you know, it was originally talked about as 2,900, then it became 3,500 and gradually grew. I, I, I think it would be much better to uh, say from the outset what the total scale of that new community would be so that infrastructure can be planned on that basis rather than us, um, you know, having to then expand and expand and then work back in terms of, of what the infrastructure is needed to support that. Um, I think there's also an issue there in terms of the scale of sort of planting the seed for, for, for growth beyond this plan period. This is, is potentially a 20 year plan to, to 2040. But as we've seen, as we've, we've looked at the, the different options is that we are running out of suitable sites in much of the district. And therefore, if, if we are to, to plan for a new community, to my mind, it, it makes sense to have a long term vision for that new community, its ultimate scale and plan for growth not just in this plan period, but beyond this plan period. Um, there is an assumption in that, that the housing need will, will support that, but I, I don't see that changing dramatically in terms of our, our housing need moving forward. Um, obviously, we don't know what will happen with the standard method and, and government's plans, but there will always be a need for new homes. Um, I don't see that changing. Uh, so I think it makes sense to, to plan ahead beyond this plan period as well. Thank you, Chair. Thanks very much for that, Ed. We now move to Councillor Skinner, please. Oh, wow. How fitting to come in behind Ed from what he's just said, because he actually has said all the things I absolutely believe we should be following. I've said on this, these planning, strategic planning meetings many times before, and we've got to understand what this is. This isn't about a process whereby mem by a call for sites is almost here's an application, do we like it or not? It's got nothing to do with that. It's just calling in an area of land. We will decide what goes where, when and why. And the numbers of houses that people put in is not something that would be left to the developer or the landowner to decide. It's for us to decide. What we've identified is an area of land. <clears throat> what I've said, excuse me, what I've said at many of these meetings, we need always do this all from the wrong way, wrong way up. We start with the threat that is potentially usually a political threat for many of where are these houses going to go and are they going to be in my backyard? No, thank you. And that threat starts the wrong way round because where we have to be is sufficing to government policy on how many numbers we have to build. We should start a strategic plan, and Ed has absolutely laid it out. And it's actually been said by other members before, but not just quite in a straight line that, that Ed delivered his, his comments, his views. And that is, if we look at tier one of our plan, we've put in our strategic process through the call of sites to Exmouth. Let's just take this as an example, as a strategic planning example. One of the constraints of Exmouth, of course, is the availability to have land availability within Exmouth. And what we're doing with the sites that have come forward in the farm of which I used to farm myself with my own family many years ago, different sites come forward, fields hither and dither, other pieces of land coming forward. We all know that and understand that. But in actual fact, by de declaring Exmouth as a tier one site, meaning that we're looking to put probably a thousand, if not more houses in Exmouth, 2000 upward that how is that really going to work? And when you look at how that's going to work, we've got to start off with infrastructure because it's the infrastructure that's going to allow us to do the things that we want to do and not only in this plan period. I was convinced many years ago in my previous life when I had a small senior role within this authority that actually when we started talking about the 3052, 
and where development was going to take place in the long strategic plan, what we should have had within our forethought, and we need to do it now, is to actually say that if we do that, we do need to get a road. There's absolutely no doubt about it from the 3052 to the, 30, to the uh, A30. <clears throat> in other words, we've got to bring in the employment space. Hello. And the employment Hello. space... Hello, my darling. Councillor, yeah. you're, you're not on mute. Sorry, Mike. Apologies, Councillor Skinner. Carry on. Uh, Lowers me thread a bit now. Um, so the employment space from the airport coming backward, looking towards Exeter, is a natural strategic planning gift. Our growth is not just for our area, but the surrounding area. And that surrounding area worked within the GASP area of to where that was. And particularly looking from Exeter, looking to, do, to uh, work outwards. And people that live in Exeter will work in our patch. And in fact, if you actually look at Exeter's strategic plan, you'll see that they're looking to build because they've got to get their housing numbers up on places like Marsh Barton. What sense does it make that Exeter has to deliver housing in an area that they've got land for employment and that the people that are increased as the population increases Exeter and yet the employment space is going to move out? And where are they going to move to? And I'll tell you exactly where they're going to move to. They're going to move partly into our patch. They might, some might go up to Ufcom, some might go around to the sites that are available. It doesn't make strategic planning sense to think in this way. We have to work together with our neighbours to ensure we provide a strategic plan that looks to the future. And that future is developing that road means that we will need a roundabout on the 3052. And that roundabout on the 3052, which is not within this plan, but Ed touched on it, because if we don't get this bit right, when we go to do the next plan, we're curtailed again. And all we've done is we're almost hemming ourselves in because we didn't think far enough forward. So we're going to have to get a road that's going to go from the 3052 to Exmouth. It's not in this plan. I know it's not. And I don't need anybody to tell me that that's the place we're in. But I'll tell you what we do need to do. We need to leave the door open that it could be in the next plan. So we need to think about when we're talking about a new town, and I, I absolutely agree with many members before, and Peter Faithful, sorry, Councillor Peter Faithful, actually started this debate out in talking the way that he talked in the way that he went out. He was absolutely bang on the money. He absolutely understands what it is we need to do in, in strategic planning and where we need to be. And, and Councillor Andrew Moulding has spoken times talking about Axminster. It makes absolute sense that we are spreading our housing numbers throughout the district of, uh, throughout East Devon. But what we have to do, and surely it's just, no, it's just common to me, it's, it's simple. We have to start with the infrastructure first because we are not just talking about the infrastructure in this plan for this amount of housing. We're talking about the infrastructure of the stuff that's already broken that needs to be put right. And Councillor Howe will know. He'll talk many times about the flooding issues, for example, in his patch, where the pressure that he has is whopping amounts of houses going down on to Cliff St. Mary and how that's going to be uh, mitigated. And I think they can over perhaps a long period of time, but you can't put five, six, seven thousand, eight thousand houses and put the concrete, the tarmac, and all the rest of it to go with it, and say this is going to work when there is already an issue down at Cliff St. Mary with flooding. Already. And that's without the implications of what the rising tides may or may not bring. I'm not I'm wholly bought into that, by the way. But anyway, that's, that's a different issue. No, no need for that here today. So when we start talking about the, the issues that councillors are starting to talk about, is saying it should not be a given that necessarily a new town is going to come forward in the place that it's going to come into, and it just delivers all of our woes, almost like the path of least resistance. And I'll give an example. If we decided to go for, this panel decides to go for, example, the Greendale one, whatever it is, the one that's up the top of the hill, it will actually stop us from taking the next plan forward because we're not thinking how we're going to get from the 3052 
to Exmouth. And yet we do on this plan talk about Exmouth as a tier one priority place for development. How is that going to work? The, fr the fr infrastructure doesn't work now. So how, how is that going to work? We're just, members, I, I, I call on you because I, I think it's, we've come to a point whereby what the call of sites has done, which is absolutely brilliant, it's identified all of those places where we know we have land. And we have to have a really serious debate about where we want to see that, who those houses going. And Councillor uh, Allen spoke earlier about some housing taking place. It was quite a considerable number, I believe, what Councillor Allen spoke about. And I won't repeat the numbers. I can't remember what he said. But quite a serious amount of housing going at East Honham. So we need to take serious consideration about Honiton that is in the heart of East Devon, about Axminster that Councillor Molden, if he's banged on it once, he's banged on it several times, the requirement and the need for a road to go around Axminster in the way that you do it. You guys up there know Axminster far better than I do. It's not for me to say that, but it's a definite need of where that's going to be. And the housing is going to be delivering this infrastructure along with what will be required from central government to help out where it will. But if you don't define what you need your infrastructure to be, you then can't define about how much money is going to come from each site. Because make no mistake, developers building a number of houses, it's a, just a pot. And it's for uh, then us as a local authority decide how many affordables do we want? How much do we want to go on the road? How much do we want into football pitches or whatever it is we're going to do? And it's the that pot of money has got a limited amount before it impacts on the value of the housing. And what we're trying to do is get a housing that is affordable. So we're... we're Chair, through you, if you don't mind. What Mr. Freeman said, I wish we could write it down and we could actually have word for word what he said and concentrate on thinking of his words that he used because he was so, so accurate in how he put his point over. And we are at a crossroads right here and now at this meeting here today about how we're going to go forward. It's clear to me, Chair that not all members are beginning to be tied into a one scenario of a one town in one place solving all our problems. That is clear in coming out loud and clear today. I'll leave it to that. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to speak. Thank you very much for that, Councillor Skinner. Um, Councillor Howe, I think you've been teed up quite nicely in a few different places there by Councillor Skinner, so over to you. Thank you, and uh, as usual, a very passionate and uh, impassioned speech by Councillor Skinner. Um, I suppose it's me trying to trying to work some realism into this because everything everyone said is dead right. I can't deny it, absolutely. But we have a major problem in East Devon and that is called a five-year housing land supply and lack of time. Now, quite rightly, uh, Chair, as you've said before, we need to get this done. And as I'm sure the leader of the council also emphasised, the fact that we need to push this through in relative haste, I won't say total haste, but relative haste to maintain our five-year housing land supply. But then we get bogged down to things like this new community. Councillor Skinner is quite right. As far as I'm concerned, there's only one site that fits any of the bills to actually alleviate some of the problems we have in East Devon. Um, but the delivery vehicle is critical. We don't want again to be in a situation where we've got 3,000 homes with only one small corner shop um, and no other infrastructure that's floating around it. We need to make sure the infrastructure is delivered in a timely manner and in the right phasing order and how it's going to be done. And more importantly, we don't want a new community proposed in a new local plan in two years time and starts building before we've even got the town centre built in the first one, Cranbrook. So we need to be really mindful about how we're doing this and how we're going to do this. So with that thought in mind, I want us to split our local plan. I want us to take the new town out of our local plan, which gives it more time as a separate document to be properly planned, properly itemised, properly sorted out. And ideally, first off, we need the delivery vehicle to know that it's going to be delivered in a constructive and correct manner, not for the 
you know, expedience of us councillors here for the next four, five, six years or whatever it is, and then the problems roll in later. We need to do it right. And at present, all we get is more and more questions and less and less answers because the answers are further down the track coming and uh, are not here now. We need the right facts before us to make the right decisions. And we can't deny there are so many issues we have that splitting the new town out of the current local plan, as we did with Cranbrook before, so it's not a new way of doing things, um, and giving it a master plan of its own to come, to come later, and then allow us to concentrate on our communities, Exmouth and other communities as well, to make sure we get the developments working in those areas correctly, to move forward in a timely manner with our local plan, maintain our five-year housing land supply, and make sure the work is done right to deliver the new town in the right order with all the correct infrastructure, you know, which isn't going to happen overnight anyway. Mr. Freeman himself admits any new town we do put in a local plan is, well, what was it, uh, Mr. Freeman, good five, six, seven years, possibly further out anyway. But we as a committee need to make sure it's done in the right, for the right reasons and for the future, not just here and now. So I implore, let's split this. Let's take it out of the equation and let it run alongside our current local plan and work on it really hard. Don't get me wrong. We're not going to give up on this local, uh, the, the new town. In fact, if it's in our local plan as a separate document, then it's got to be delivered. So we've got to work on it, but it stops us arguing about it and trying to get half answers when we haven't got all the answers in front of us, which is what we need to drive it forward. Let's concentrate on our villages. Let's concentrate on our current towns, get those developments right, and alongside work on the new town when we get all the reports in that gives us the correct delivery method and where it's going to be to go forward. And um, Mr. Freeman, you know, that can be the only answer I can see going forward. Um, to be honest, it can even deal with the 950 homes you're short, but it's going to be less than that because the government numbers are going to drop. So we know that for sure. Um, but we've got to do something and this is just going to go on and on and on otherwise. So I implore, let's, let's do this right. Let's split it out deal with it as a separate document and get on with our local plan in the best way possible. Thank you. Thanks very much for that, Mike. There's just one thing I need to just pick up here because it, I think Councillor Ingham said it at a previous meeting, Councillor Howe, you've just mentioned it there. I'm, there's nothing that's come through to Ed Freeman or myself on knowing that the housing numbers are gonna drop. Now, I don't know where this is coming from. So can I just ask, our conservative members that you might know something that we don't but the government if i can chair the government has made it quite clear a number of times now and it was last reported last week in the telegraph again not exactly cast iron don't get me wrong they are looking at the numbers they are looking to review the numbers but it has been said in many different chains in many different places so we all have to have some faith that those numbers are going to be looked at now there is a chance they might go up but of course, at the same time, those numbers themselves, because they rely on building numbers being built currently and the overall economy is expected to be on a bit of a bumpy ride because of various things going on at present. This year's numbers and probably next are expected to be lower than they currently are anyway. Now, you know, that thing's got to pay attention to. Now, we're working on 950 roughly. I think that's the right number to do, but that doesn't necessarily mean that will be the number in force when we actually put our local plan out for its final decision. And that's what we need to be ready for, the worst case, which is 950 we hope, and then be ready to take advantage of a lower number when it comes along with all good graces. So you know, that's where it is and that's where it's going along. And if you watch the press and what's being said in parliament, there are warm signs that a better number could be coming our way. Fantastic, thanks very much for that, Councillor Howe. Um, I'll take Councillor Moulding and Councillor Arnott because they yet to speak. Councillor Skin and Councillor A, I, I do feel that we've got other agenda items to come to, so we do need to move on. Uh, we have a proposal on the table that we need to vote on. So I'll take Councillor Moulding next, please. Thank you, Chair. And I'm very pleased that Councillor Allen and Councillor Skinner mentioned a certain town in the east of the district in Axminster, 
where the word used was, at the moment, we don't think it's deliverable. And I've heard the words deliverable mentioned several times in the debate this afternoon, because the provision of a new town, supposedly, with no evidence about the infrastructure, whether it is indeed deliverable, is the funding there for it to be deliverable? There are no plans for the settlement. And I just cannot think that we can include this in a local plan without first knowing what infrastructure is required, where it's going to go, and can it be deliverable? This town cannot be deliverable at this stage. I'm not saying, like Axminster, that it couldn't go back in because at the moment we don't have a master plan, we don't have any idea of what infrastructure is required, as Councillor Skinner mentioned, and we must con continue to develop a master plan first. How can you put this in the local plan as part of the inclusion in a local plan without it being deliverable? And can anybody say that the new town? and the funding required for the infrastructure is deliverable? Of course it's not. So therefore I shall certainly vote against the inclusion of a new community as part of the spatial strategy for the local plan. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much for that, Councillor Moulding. I think I just need to, to put across that it is just the fact that we are voting in principle that this is what we come, uh, that we're looking towards all the evidence base will come forward at a later date. Um, Councillor Arnold, we come to you, please. Thank you very much, Chair. Yes, uh, and this has been a great discussion. A uh, lot of views shared, a uh, lot of new views, a lot of old views re-aired and so forth. But I mean, I must just look at what this agenda item is about. Um, it's not actually committing us to anything. And I think with the uh, helpful uh, amendment proposed by Councillor Allen, which I'm prepared to uh, well, as I said, I'm happy to second. Um, I, I'd be glad if we went for a vote, please. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for that. So, Mrs Shaw, can you take us to a vote, please? Yes, Chair. Could I just check with the mover, Councillor Allen, and the seconder, Councillor Arnott? Now, Councillor Allen only mentioned about amending the re second recommendation. I presume you're both recommending the first recommendation as well to go to members for the vote. Yes, I'm very much uh, recommending the first one, but the modification of the second one to take out the agreement in principle and replace it with the different set of words so that Thank it isn't a an agreement in principle. No, it's an agreement to consider the inclusion is the wording I have. Yes. Thank yeah. you. Is Councillor Arnott in agreement Thank you. with the two recommendations? Thank you. Thank you. So, members, you have before you two recommendations in this vote. One, to note the previous reports and debates that have taken place on the issue of a further new community, infrastructure requirements and delivery vehicles. And the second recommendation as amended that you agree to consider the inclusion of a new community as part of the spatial strategy within the working draft local plan, subject to this being reviewed as further evidence comes forward. Members, please press your green tick if you're in support of the recommendations, press your red cross if you're against the recommendations, or raise your electronic hand if you wish to indicate you're abstaining from the vote. The vote is currently underway. So we have um, six votes in support, five votes against and no abstentions. So that is recommended for approval. Thank you very much for that, Wendy. So we then move on to agenda item eight, which is the settlement hierarchy. And again, it's over to Mr. Freeman to present a report. Over to you, Ed, please. Uh, thank you, Chair. So, Chair, uh, Chair, sorry, sorry, I was sorry. Did I, did I ought to, uh, Wendy? Oh, yeah. I, could I ask you if you would, because I'm not sure if Talton's going to come into it. So I think I ought to step out and then if 
if it's okay, well, I'll step back. But yeah, I don't think I ought to be push, pushing for. I don't think I ought to be pushing for a, a village of which I have a, a, a personal interest in. Thank you, Chair. Before we move forward, could you just check Thanks if counts, Councillor Hayward is in the meeting? I know his name is up, but his camera is switched off. I just wanted to know to know if he's going to be in this agenda item. Councillor Hayward, is he still manning the desk? No, unfortunately he's okay. not. Okay, thank so, you. Ed, we need to hear in your report, please. Uh, thank you, Chair. So uh, this report follows on from a discussion at members' previous meeting with regard to the settlement hierarchy and uh, a resolution in which members uh, stated that they wish to consider options for additional sites to be added to tier four of the settlement hierarchy. Um, so uh, we, we've pulled this report together um, to highlight two options for doing that. Um, there, there, there is an issue here of, of kind of sequencing of events because one of members of a resolutions at the previous meeting was to undertake a further call for sites, which you'll see is considered in the, the next item on this agenda. Um, and that that call for sites should focus on the uh, settlement identified settlements identified within the settlement hierarchy so uh, it is key that we bottom out what constitutes each tier of the settlement hierarchy before we undertake that work hence the timing of this report um, so it starts in terms of background section of just talking members through the background of this you'll recall two reports were brought through the committee during the course of last year uh, the first was the first draft of the role and function of settlement study uh, the second the final version uh, at that time taking into account members views which was agreed and that sets out uh, the four tiers on the bottom of page 26 as was agreed at that time so what we've done is uh, we've looked back at the evidence to see um, what the evidence would support potentially in terms of adding additional settlements into tier four of the, the hierarchy uh, based on effectively lowering the, the, the threshold in terms of the numbers of facilities and services available in those communities to justify uh, their inclusion. So option one uh, looks at potentially including uh, four additional settlements, Collie Ford, Rockbeer, Upottery and Woodbury Salt. Uh, these are based on them having uh, a similar level of facilities and services within them uh, and, and uh, relatively high employment density and, and other issues that were considered in, in the study. Um, it is important to note that there are some key day-to-day -day facilities missing. For example, there's no shop in a pottery, uh, would result in all rock beer and Colliford does not have a primary school. Um, which essentially are the reasons why we hadn't initially included them in, in the settlement hierarchy. Um, but those four would be the next uh, sort of tranche of, of settlements if we were to lower the threshold in terms of the services and facilities required uh, to uh, be put into tier four. Uh, option two then looks at sort of lowering that threshold further in terms of the services and facilities, at which point a further eight villages in addition to those in option one uh, could be included. Uh, again, uh, these generally have uh, at least five of the facilities identified in the study, um, but are, are, are missing uh, one or more key facilities. So you'll see in the list in paragraph 2.6 in the report, those uh, settlements listed uh, and the facilities, the key facilities that are missing from, from those locations. Um, so those are uh, two options basically for, for members to consider. Um, and as I say, I think there's not, um, we're not putting forward these options sort of as a, as a pick and mix, as it were. I think it's, it's one option or, or the other because those settlements have a similar level of services and facilities. So if we're following the evidence, it, it should be those as, as, as groups of, of settlements where similar services and facilities are applied um, to ensure that we're consistent with the evidence and as I've been saying throughout these meetings evidence is key uh, when it comes to examination of the plan we need to be able to support all of the policies uh, through clear evidence and have followed a logical approach supported by that evidence. The, uh, the other thing I'd say uh, while speaking on this item is while we've been speaking I have received an email from the clerk to Offwell Parish Council um, 
in response to this report, and I think it's been copied to a number of members. I haven't had an opportunity to read the email in full, but I do note that it is highlighting uh, the shortage of services and facilities within Offwell Village uh, and uh, is not supportive of its inclusion under Tier 4 within the settlement hierarchy. So I just draw that to members' attention. Clearly, the intention uh, would be uh, within the timescales of the local plan to undertake full consultation and engagement on whichever settlement hierarchy option members favour through consultation on the draft plan later this year, at which point, obviously, the views of the parish council and the residents of each of these settlements could be taken on board. Thank you, Chair. Thanks very much, that, uh, Mr. Eaton. Ed, just, just for the benefit of those watching, can you just name the in the second option the eight villages that are proposed to, to come forward? Uh, yes, apologies, Chairman. Uh, they are Raymond's Hill, Offwell, Colleton Riley, Clist Hyden, Distant George, Stockland, Dalwood, and Tallerton. Perfect. Thanks very much. Uh, we start outside of committee and uh, Councillor Young, you're up first, please. Thank you, uh, Chair. I managed to get my hand up first this time. Um, yeah, speaking as Ward Councillor for uh, Limston and Woodbury, um, I would obviously agree with uh, Limston and Woodbury being in the, the category they are. Um, I question Exton to a certain extent. Um, it's um, qu quite a small village. It's a um, bit of a, I think people would describe it as an upmarket village. Um, and th there's a limit to the amount of development that can be uh, put there um, before it uh, digresses into the next village. Um, so th there needs to be some care on how much development um, some of these small villages um, uh, can take. Um, uh, moving on to Woodbury Salterson, again, I could see that that can be um, uh, uh, have some development. Um, uh, I spe spe speak personally because I live here in Woodbury Salterson. Uh, yes, we can take some development, but yes, we haven't got a, um, a shop. We only get five odd uh, buses. Um, we don't have a bus on Sundays, um, so there are issues with that. Um, most people have to have a car um, if they need to go down, down to the doctors, uh, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so it's a no. We don't want that mass development on our doorstep um, to ruin the, the, the village. Um, it needs to be done. Uh, sensibly and carefully, uh, these villages um, have got um, uh, wonderful characters um, in and uh, lovely um, lo uh, locations that people like to live in. And we don't want to ruin what is already here. Thank you. Thanks very much, for that Councillor Young. Uh, we then move to Councillor Faithful, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, as I said before about building in small hamlets and communities in the rural countryside, I feel there's a need for a Tier 5, which is basically everything below Tier 4, and where if we weren't identify where the affordable homes are needed, we work, say, we need two affordable homes here, somebody can come along and build one market house to, to make it viable. Um, but basically, I don't know, I mean, I can't make a formal proposal, but I hope somebody else will take it and run with it. Um, creating a tier five for the, for the bottom end. Thank you, Chair. Thanks very much, Councillor Faithful. We can currently do that through rural exception sites where uh, you produce 66% um, social or affordable housing and then 33 percent market to make it viable so those can come through in our in our most rural locations to ensure that um social and affordables are delivered councillor parr we come to you next please thank you um 
Yes. Firstly, you have just endorsed Colleton Neighbourhood Plan, which of course covers the whole parish of Colleton, including Collie Ford. And in that neighbourhood plan, it states quite clearly and repeats the local plan um, status for Collie Ford, which is that it's in countryside. And there was huge support for that um, statement and um, people wanting uh, strengthened green wedge policies. The green wedge is land between Collet and Colliford, Colliford and Seaton. So that is quite clear on the one hand. On the other hand, there is a community land trust in Colliton, and two of the members, at least, of that board are from Colliford, and there is a wish for affordable housing in the parish. And I think there is some support for, um, well, people want young families to be able to stay in the area and rather like Councillor Faithful. Um, I think there might be support um, for uh, affordable housing. And people really do not want um, development, but I think for one or two for families um, might be acceptable. I do know there's a brownfield site in Colliford as well, um, but uh, I think opinion is very divided as to whether development should be allowed there. Um, and I think when you go out to consultation, you will get very mixed views for Colliford becoming part of tier um, four. Thank you. Thanks very much for that, Councillor Parr. Um, Councillor Arnold, we come to you next, please. I think there may be people outside committee before me, Chair. Is that right? Apologies, Councillor Arnold. Yeah, Councillor Miller's, I've just seen his hand go up. Apologies, Councillor Miller, over to you. Thanks, Chair. Um, sorry for the belated uh, hand there. I know, I know you've moved inside the committee. My, my comment will probably be like none others. Um, so sorry to go off on a tangent, but it's on um, the issue of gypsies and traveller sites. Um, last summer in my ward, there was a, a huge uh, issue with one of the parks being, um, being used by gypsies and travellers it wasn't an appropriate park for them and it, it caused a great deal of distress within the within the local community in section two of the report it identifies that there has been a long-standing challenge of identifying these sites and that very few past submissions have promoted land for this sector of the community but in the third section of the report whilst um, the report gives detail of how they will specifically um, promote things like contacting the Chamber of Commerce to try to increase interest in, uh, in identifying employment land. It doesn't specifically, as far as I can see, identify any strategy to um, encourage um, landowners to come forward to, to, um, to promote land for the purpose of accommodating gypsy and travellers. I understand this is a significant challenge, but I wanted to ask you, Chair, or, or Ed, how he envisages he, he's, he would be able to um, to uh, encourage this. Are there any other councils that he could um, he could take any uh, he, he could learn from? It's a problem in my ward. I have to raise it, um, and and I just hope that there is a way we can we can encourage landowners to to uh, to accommodate gypsy and travellers. Thank you, Chair. Thanks very much, Councillor Miller. Um, Councillor Miller. I'm, I can't get the report up currently. I'm really struggling with uh, my internet connection. Are you sure that we're on the correct uh, agenda item? We, we're currently talking settlement hierarchy, not the call for sites. I sincerely apologise. <laughs> you should have um, interrupted me. I'm really sorry, Chair. Maybe maybe in the next item, no we'll come back to that and just note my comment. We'll, we'll sorry, come, everyone. We'll come to it. Taking uh, the subject. Yeah. I'll, I'll ask Ed to, to cover it at the, the next agenda item. Councillor Arna, we come into committee and we come to you, please. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, yes, just uh, coming in behind Councillor Parr there, um, a number of facts is 
Yes, Colson has, as you remember, just uh, just got its neighbourhood plan uh, done, uh, and it does not uh, allow for anything such as being proposed here. But let me come back to that in a minute. Just looking at Colliford, which is in my ward, of course, uh, and I'm also a parish councillor that includes Colliford. Um, it, uh, I think the report says it hasn't got a primary school. Uh, it hasn't actually got a school. It's got Colliton Grammar School, but that is a selective school. And I would be astonished if more than one or two children living in Colliford per year go there. So it hasn't got any schools. It's got one absolutely sweet, a lovely little shop with the butchers included, but it's those are very small with massive parking issues around there. But more than anything else, it is a, it is a, one of the three principal uh, through ways into Exeter these days on the 3052. Um, and I know the 3052 comes up all over the place. It is extremely difficult to cross the road, or very much so. And there have been requests made for new crossings and so forth, and they haven't yet been successful. There are other things that one, one could say about why, why that wouldn't be suitable. Um, I think Councillor Palm makes a good point, which is, uh, but I do think it's covered by policy already. If exception sites could be identified uh, for affordable social and, and, and a small mix of something else, that's possible, of course. I'm, I'm not familiar with the Brownfield site in, in, in Colliford. Um, but in the end, I think in this argument, I'll depend upon 4.2 in the report, which uh, stresses that we're looking to keep sustainable development, uh, our spatial strategy and climate change to the fore. Um, and I can't see certainly Colliford as part of those tier of as, as part of the, the list proposed to go into tier four. I don't think it meets any of those. However, that said, Councillor Faithful's idea of a tier five, it's like having a Thunderbirds five, isn't it? Really? You, can, you can see something in that. I don't know how that would work. I don't know how we could move ahead with that. It's almost like having, you know, an extra reserve on the bench, isn't it? But as it stands, uh, I wouldn't be happy to add to the tier fours that we've already got. Um, and we've already agreed. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much for that, Councillor Arnott. Mm -hmm. Councillor Allen, we come to you next, please. Thanks, Dan. <clears throat> the only comment I want to make is that we spend an awful lot of time and money developing neighbourhood plans. And the information for those neighbourhood plans has not been presented alongside these suggestions. And that's a real shame because when you have all that effort of local people put into this area of planning and the officers are not presenting that information at a critical point of decision, I think that's something that is regretted. And I wish I could have seen the neighbourhood plan information positioned alongside these proposals so that we know exactly what is the local opinion. Thank you, Chair. Thanks very much, Councillor Allen. Councillor Davey, over to you. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, I still make the point that I think simply totting up the number of facilities um, within um, a settlement is not necessarily a, a particularly good measure and I feel as though we need some kind of waiting system. Uh, i just take as an example, um, it, I, uh, much as I welcome having a shop in a village, I think with the advent of online deliveries um, and, um, and, and people getting a, a delivery by van, maybe a shop isn't as essential, for instance, as a school. You can't send your kids to school uh, by uh, phoning up Tesco. Um, ditto uh, uh, Village Hall. Um, uh, now, I don't know what the waiting for that should be, and I wouldn't want to be the person who tried to work this out. Um, or a church. These are things you have to go to in person um, and, uh, and can go a long way to support uh, local communities and and bring that feeling of, of community. Um, so I 
I think we need to look carefully at which facilities are present in various settlements um, rather than uh, simply going by the numbers of those facilities. Um, with regard to car travel, I, well, I just think, you know, the, the that genie is out of the bottle and um, I'm watching petrol prices going up all the time at the pumps and I see absolutely no change in the number of cars on the road. Um, and um, but Exmouth is considered a sustainable location, but it still gets huge amount of traffic. Um, and a lot of that traffic is coming from outside Exmouth going into the town centre. Um, so, uh, you can have a sustainable location, but people will still opt to use their cars. Now, Mr. Freeman has frequently made the point that it's not whether people do use their cars, but would you have an option if you didn't uh, have a car, if petrol prices get to the point where people even start to consider leaving their cars at home and, and using other means of transport. Um, and uh, certainly in, by those criteria, uh, people would, would be able to uh, sustain some of these uh, towns and villages. Um, but I think the criteria for Tier 4 were quite important as well. And I'm, I'm trying to look back. I can't find it. Uh, I think it might have been helpful to have had it in the, um, in the, uh, the document. Um, that what we were actually going to allow in tier four, I seem to recall it was just modest development and, and where that accorded with local needs or something like that. Um, so although we are considering whether uh, certain places should be included in tier four, um, I think we're not kind of opening the floodgates to massive uh, growth of those locations. I think we're still only looking at a modest amount of development, but perhaps Mr. Freeman could uh, just confirm that. Thank you. Thanks very much for that, Councillor Davey. Ed, can I bring you in at this point? Can I also ask the question of, um, I was looking through and I know that Orliscombe was mentioned previously, and it's something that uh, at the briefing session you said that you'd go and ask. Um, can I just ask why Orliscombe wasn't included with these other tier four proposed tier four settlements? Because it, it does have a, a school, a community centre, a bus route. Uh, yes, thank you, Chair. Um, yes, I do address Orliscombe at paragraph 3.3 .3 in the report. Um, and, and essentially it doesn't have a level of services and facilities that is equivalent to either of those listed in option one or option two. Uh, it's partly because some of the facilities you, you named, particularly the sports pitch, are located outside of the settlement and beyond the easy reach of the settlement. Um, and so they've not been, they've sort of been discounted, I suppose, on that basis. Um, so we don't consider all this come to be um, on a par with the options that that, that we've put forward uh, at, at this stage. Um, so yes, yeah, so just just to go back through the, the comments that we made so far. Um, yeah, I hear what Councillor Allen says about the neighbourhood plans. Um, I mean, obviously the local plan is is higher up the the, <laughs> the hierarchy of, of plans. Fear of using the word hierarchy again, um, and uh, ultimately, uh, as much as uh, we obviously want to take on board uh, local opinion. Um, the, the inclusion of assessment in the hierarchy needs to be evidence-led fundamentally, and we need to make um, these assessments based on on the, the planning merits uh, of, of each of these settlements as, as a, a location for growth. Um, and that probably brings me nicely to, to Councillor Davies' uh, last point about um, what we were proposing in these these tiers. So the the proposal in the in the working draft of the plan was that all the settlements in the tiers have a built-up area boundary within which general growth could go, fundamentally. Um, and it was outside of these these tiers where um, policy requirements around uh, rural exception sites, uh, development coming forward through uh, community-led initiatives, through neighbour plans, community land trusts and everything would still enable growth to come forward uh, in those settlements that sit below tier four and would potentially sit in Councillor Faithful's tier five. Um, uh, so I don't think uh, officers and members are necessarily talking uh, about anything different here to what's, what's in the plan. I think it's, it's just 
all, all settlements would have the opportunity to have those exception sites and those community-led developments coming forward, whether they're in the hierarchy or not. The hierarchy is about the most sustainable settlements and, and having a clear hierarchy to where we should be trying to, to, um, to locate growth fundamentally. Um, and, and so I think that's, that's the issue here. Um, I hear what Councillor Davis says about on, online deliveries, but um, I, I think he almost gave my response in, in what he said, which is it's about giving people choice to my mind. Uh, I'm sure people won't, e even in the settlements that do have a village shop, be doing their weekly shop there, and we'll probably be having uh, a main grocery shop delivered or be driving out to, to the nearest supermarket to do that. Um, but I think in terms of the sustainability of those settlements, having a shop is, is, a, is a clear um, measure of, of the sustainability of those settlements. Just having somewhere where you can pop and buy a, a paper or a pint of milk or a um, loaf of bread or, or something basic like that without having to jump in to your car can reduce people's car journeys uh, significantly. Um, and I think that's important to the sustainability of these settlements and our response to the climate change emergency fundamentally. Um, I, I'm under no illusions that people are going to give up their cars, um, but uh, if we can at least reduce their car journeys and encourage walking and cycling to facilities that are available within easy reach, then we can at least reduce people's car journeys uh, and reduce carbon emissions as, as a result of that. Um, so. I can see some merit in, in, in trying to sort of prioritise the services and facilities that are available, but I think it's very difficult to do because what one person might prioritise, another might prioritise quite differently. Um, for example, uh, I think Councillor Davy mentioned a church. Some people would no doubt prioritise that very highly. Uh, others who, who are not so inclined would not prioritise that at all in terms of sustainability. Um, so I think it's very difficult to get into prioritising those uh, kind of things. And, and I think it's, um, it's very difficult to do in a, a sort of empirical way, which is what we've tried to do here is to make it as objective as possible um, and, and follow evidence uh, rather than uh, rely too much on subjective judgment. Um, so it, it is a difficult one, uh, I, I accept, but um, I, I would stress the point that I've, I've made that just because a settlement isn't within these hierarchies doesn't mean uh, that it's going to be preserved forevermore as it is and never allowed to grow or have any development. There are other policies in the plan that enable community-led development, development through neighbourhood plans, rural exception sites um, to meet specific needs of those communities. Um, so that can still happen, even if they're not within these four tiers. These four tiers, as I see it, are about locations that are sustainable to accommodate general growth requirements. Thank you, Chair. Thanks very much. So we'd come to Councillor Ingham next, please. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say uh, that I agree with my Callum with regards to neighbourhood plans. Um, and it would be really helpful if you look at, you know, 2.2, Collerford, Rockbeer, Apotry, Woodbury, Salterton, if you actually understood what those communities felt, whether they felt they were unsustainable or they were sustainable, and we haven't sought their opinions. And what often happens, Chair, what always happens, is we expect communities when they create their neighbourhood plans, they have to tie in my, uh, uh, legal requirement with our local plan. But when we're writing our local plan, do we listen to them? Do we bother? You know the real answer on that one, Chair, which is, is desperately sad because sustainability uh, is, it was important with the last plan, but it certainly is uh, with the one we're looking at and what we're being asked to do with options one and two. Um, for example, uh, Chair, within um, my ward, the last few years, Limston was asked to deliver uh, or, or committed to deliver 40 and they delivered 60 dwellings. Woodbury, is, uh, which still hasn't got a neighbourhood plan, got caught out. And in an 18 month period, planning applications were approved for over 80 houses. 
It shows you how important a neighborhood plan is to a community, whether they have one or not. And we really should be paying attention to this so that when you look at option two, you could actually say, well, the people in Clist Hyden think this, but the funny thing is in Stockland, they have a completely different view. How is it that we can look at two pieces of paper like this and, and anticipate, because it's not the decision now, anticipate what may or may not happen over the next 20 years with regards to the growth or not of those dwellings? I don't think it's right. And, and can I just say, um, Councillor Davies said that Exmouth is a sustainable community. Wow, I really disagree with that. It isn't at all. It's a dormitory town. What we should be doing there is creating more jobs. And I don't want to go off down a different rabbit hole. But if you mention these things, it's very important that we get them right. And so I'm very concerned, Chair, that we have enough information or evidence to take a decision. I'm really concerned by the scant evidence I've got on option two, telling us that they're not sustainable. What we need to decide is if we build in that village, uh, will we help them to become sustainable or will they will we create a bigger problem? That should be our, our logic, yes? Not by just creating a list and say they're roughly the same so it will fit. Uh, I'm not sure what the full answer is, Chairman, but I don't think we're going down the right in the right direction at the moment. And let's come back to what Councillor Allen says. We really have to understand each of these communities so we can help them rather than hinder. Thank you, Chair. Thanks very much, Councillor Ingham. And without putting words in Councillor Davies' mouth, I think he was referring to the hierarchy, stating that Exmouth is a sustainable centre, and that's probably why he's got his hand up. Um, Councillor Bailey, we come to you next, please. Thank you. Um, well, I'd like to um, pretty much follow on from uh, Councillor Allen and Councillor Ingham in that I, well, this kind of report just kind of, um, for me, without wishing to be kind of critical, kind of sums up the issues that I have with the direction of travel of our neighbourhood plan in that, you know, it's all heavy, heavily weighted to the villages and we're not listening. So we haven't asked the parishes, the parish councils for these communities, whether they want houses. They're tiny little communities. We haven't looked at their neighbourhood plans um, and we're going to be potentially putting ha more, more houses. We don't know how many jobs on, certainly I couldn't see it on this report. I know it's probably been done in the past. So I feel that time and time again, we're not looking at sustainable development. Sustainable development is where the jobs, services and facilities are. You know, Clist Hyden. I mean, it's tiny and, you know, we want to put it in tier four. And I think that, you know, I, I have to take issue with um, what um, Councillor Davy said about shops not being important and, you know, as important as, say, a school in a local community. Because for some people who aren't on the Internet, uh, shops are their local shops are their absolute lifeline. And I think the danger with this kind of strategy of kind of like picking out little communities and, you know, all oh, this has got a shop and that one hasn't got a shop. You know, those shops are vulnerable to, to, to being closed down. So then what happens? We've allocated loads of houses or some houses or we've put it in tier four. And frankly, you know, I would say to all those communities, if you were in tier four, you could end up like West Hill where, where the officers put forward 101 houses. Oh, and a potential for another 470. So, you know, we can't call that modest growth. So I think this is pattern in our local plan. What we've been doing, we haven't been focusing on actual sustainable development. We haven't addressed what we could do to our town centres to build in our town centres. We focus far too much and we're hammering the villages and we're not listening to our communities. And it's something I feel really strongly about. And as a result, I don't like either of these proposals very much um, because I feel that we're picking on the villages again. So, um, yeah, I don't really like either of them. And I feel that we haven't got enough information um, and that also we haven't really consulted. Um, we haven't brought in the parishes. So I guess that would go back to what Councillor Giles said at the start of the meeting. Thank you. Thanks very much, Councillor Bailey. 
Um, and just for clarity for every for everyone's benefit, the reasons why we are including or putting this report forward to include more tier four settlements is that was the previous decision of the committee that you wish to see more for tier four settlement uh, tier four settlements added to the hierarchy. If that's not the case, again, it can be up for committee to. It, the third option could be that we add no extra extra communities to or villages to to the tier four settlements. That is a third option that can be taken by committee, um, and it, it could be proposed today. It's completely in in the committee's gift on what they wish to see come forward. Mm -hmm. Councillor, how we come to you, please. Um, first, I think I need to make a declaration because I own and run a store, so I've got a village community store that's been mentioned a lot. Um, so I've got to make that declaration straight away, but obviously my store hasn't been mentioned and I'm not going to talk about that any further. Um, I need to pick up on an awful lot of other points that have been made today. And an awful lot's been said about these communities, these villages that we're contemplating adding to the tier four and their neighborhood plans. Well, I sit in a tier four village now that has a neighborhood plan, as does many other other tier four villages. And a number of them are, don't particularly think they're sustainable in tier four. So what are we going to do about that? We're going to take notice of some neighborhood plans, but not others. We need to work on neighborhood plans and work out what we're doing. But uh, following on Council Bailey's um, comments, and I'm actually with her, we need to limit the amount of development we're putting any in any of these tier four villages. And I'll make a recommendation to our to our thing. And it also um, applies to the call for sites and everything else as well. Um, so whichever way we go, whether we choose option two, option one, two or three, whichever it is, um, or none of the above, I would like to say that none of the tier four villages will be allowed to grow more than, well, I was going to say 5%, but let's be generous, let's say 10% over their current numbers. So none of them are going to be swamped one way or another. And that puts an absolute limit on those tier four villages. And I think we need to do that to give our communities, our village communities, at least some understanding of what they're looking at in scale of growth, not just open book development, which we're looking at present. Now, I heard Councillor Davy earlier say mention about this, and I can't find it anywhere where we limited the size of the community growths in the tier four villages. So I think we need to enforce it. And I think we need a motion there to put it in. And I will make that motion as option, well, recommendation two, I suppose it is, um, as an understanding that we will not be going to call for sites on villages that already have plenty of allocations that have come in through the ELAR um, and the previous call for sites and also that no village will grow more than 10%. I mean, if committee wants to make it 5%, I'd happily go for five, but I think we need to be very mindful about what we're doing. Um, I, going back to the options, the two options, I actually prefer option, uh, Councillor Faithful's option of a tier five, you know, because I think then we could possibly do um, the old 5% growth in those tier fives or less, maybe even 1% growth in those tier fives you know, estimating around about five homes over 10 years, five, 10 years, well, it's nothing, is it? It's tiny, um, but it would help those little villages um, while making sure they're not swamped in, you know, and all the rest of it. So I'm, I'm open for that one, but I'm certainly gonna move option two um, or recommendation two is to make sure none of these villages are growing more than 10%. So I hope I get support of that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Councillor Howe, can I just for, to try and clean it up can we go can i ask you to just propose either option one or two or you can go for the third one that we add no no villages to to tier four today um and the you obviously we take on board your second recommendation that you've just put forward all right i'll go for no villages added today and the second 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 recommendation that i made thank you perfect thank you very much can i please get a seconder for that I'll second that, Chair. Thank you very much, Councillor Davy. As a seconder, do you wish to speak at all? Um, well, I, I was going to say several things. I mean, it's been a red letter day for me because I think I've been named three times now. Uh, so, uh, uh, 
Yeah, you were quite right. Um, Councillor Ingham uh, mentioned that I said Exmouth was a sustainable settlement. I, what I was, the point I was trying to make was, on paper, it's considered sustainable, and yet people drive all over the place. Um, I, I also want to make it clear that I'm not kind of trying to diss local shops. I absolutely take what Councillor Bailey said. Um, local shops need support, and and I'm all in favour of them. Um, even within Exmouth, actually, I like to you know use a local shop that I can walk to. Um, ditto schools; they need they need support. And I think the problem here that we're trying to grapple with is that some villages don't want any growth. They feel as though they they cannot cope with any more, and others do want some modest growth in order to sustain their primary school, in order to sustain their shop, and so I think what we really need is a mechanism that enables local communities to decide. And as Councillor Howard said, the the neighbourhood plan is not necessarily um, totally the way to do that uh, because local communities can decide something in a neighborhood plan um, but I know as I sit on planning that the neighborhood plan doesn't always uh, carry as much weight as those uh, communities would like it to um, so I think that's what we need to do we need to find a mechanism that allows communities that want to grow um, or that want some modest growth to be able to enable that um, and those who don't um, not to, but I, I'm inclined to agree that at the moment we're perhaps going down a slippery slope by including even more villages in Tier 4 uh, when perhaps we we need to take a, a long, hard look. And uh, I think Mr. Freeman has, has uh, kind of rebutted some of my points quite well. Um, so I'm quite happy to, to second Councillor Howe's proposal uh, that we just don't add any more today. Um, and, uh, and and possibly open those villages up to development when they don't want it. Thanks very much, Councillor David. Councillor Allen, over to you. Thank you. Um, thanks for everybody to uh, support me on the issue of democracy and the neighbourhood plan. I really do feel that we're not in a position to make our mind up on this particular issue uh, we could make an emotional decision that we can't have any further development we could make an emotional decision to stick with one or two but in the end of the day what we're not doing is democrat uh, dem democratic decision making now going back to um, mr freeman's statement about le uh, legal evidence Neighbourhood plans have been through the planning inspectorate's screen for accepting evidence for their proposals. Why should we, at this stage, ignore them completely? It's just absolutely inappropriate. So I, I would not want to proceed with any decisions on this particular agenda until we have proper presentation in writing if necessary from Mr Freeman of what the individual um, uh, villagers want to have in, from their neighbourhood plan. I can't rule people out who want to grow or push development on people who don't. It's just bad democracy. So I would really wish that we would abandon this particular set of uh, discussions and say we want to actually come back to it with the right uh, democratic evidence from the neighbourhood plans. Thank you, Chair. Thanks very much, Councillor Allen. Councillor Arnold, over to you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, again, understand and agree with a lot that's just been said. I, I think if the last councillor, who I won't name, uh, um, doesn't mind, I don't think it's fair to describe today or the report as bad democracy, because this, this committee actually commissioned this report, as the chair has already said, to open up this subject to debate. 
but I do understand what is being said about the crucial role of neighbourhood plans and the distinctions. And we had a speaker, didn't we, from Up Ottery, what seems like four or five days ago now, who said, and can correct me if I'm wrong, we wouldn't mind a little bit extra. Whereas if you had a meeting in another one of those uh, communities who are being put forward at this stage, they, they may say no. Um, I would... I, I, I'd be grateful to understand actually what the amended recommendations are as well, Chair. I don't think we're including Councillor Howe's idea of a 10%, are we? Uh, I'm not sure we are. I think oh, I wouldn't do that if I were you. 10% of Colly Ford is a lot of homes. <laughs> I, I, wouldn't, I, I wouldn't put anything in. I think we should really think very hard about putting 5%, 10%, 1%. Because uh, you know, ten percent of a village that's got twenty houses is two. There we go. I can do maths in my head. But something that's already got you know two hundred houses, say, is then twenty, and then you're starting to look at major change. So I'm worried about that, chair. But obviously, I'll, I'll be led by the committee. Thank you. Thanks very much, Councillor Arnold. Um, we will take Councillor Bailey and then Councillor Howe, and then we'll, we'll basically sum up and go to a vote. So Councillor Bailey, over to you. Thank you. Yes, um, I would support uh, Councillor Howe's uh, proposal. Um, and I think the point about the percentage, I think it's a good one because uh, I think it's recognising that in any of those um, tier four settlements, um, they're not going to grow disproportionately. And um, just to come back to... Um, Councillor Arnott, I mean, the proposals that we've had in West Hill, um, although they've been kind of paused, I think, temporarily, was 470 plus 101. So that's something like 60% growth in, in where I live. So, um, you know, so I think it is right that there is a kind of proportionate. So if you're in tier four, you know, that there is there are only limited uh, uh, shops and services and facilities and jobs. And I think it is right that no one community um, disproportionately grows uh, and then others don't don't have any at all. So I think it's right to have a, um, a mechanism for capping that. Um, that's what I've got to say. Thanks. Thanks very much, Councillor Bailey. I just need to make the, the point that officers in their recommendations for the likes of West Hill, I know that 480 houses were put forward from the call for sites, but from the officer's recommendation for the plan, only 60 houses were allocated for the plan. So 60 homes. Um, no, that's, that's not correct. That's definitely not correct because... Um, there was 101 and then there was the other site that was potentially 470 uh, that was voted on, um, which also can, included 650. So that was to make up the additional 900. So it wasn't only 60. We potentially would have had substantially more than that. Thank you. We'll disagree on that, Councillor Bailey. Councillor Howe, over to you. Yeah, I mean, it's just to clarify to um, the leader, obviously, Councillor Arna, um, it was a maximum number. No more than 10% should ever be built in any one of the communities. I'm not proposing 10% should be built in the communities, but as Councillor Bailey has pointed out, a number of these communities are facing much larger growth than 10%, and that is the issue. In fact, my community, the largest in East Devon growth over the pr previous plan period, um, and I don't want to see that again and the implications it has. Ottery not far behind us um, in its growth. So I think a 10% maximum growth in those tier four communities is worrying nevertheless, but at least gives some certainty about the maximum size of development that could happen. So um, I wholeheartedly carry on with that. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Howell. Mr Shaw, can you take us to sum up, please? Thank you, Chair. I, I'm wondering whether... Mr. Freeman would like to comment on on uh, some of the uh, councillors. Apologies. Debate. Apologies, Mr. Shaw. Yes. Um, Ed, do you have anything you wish to comment on? Um, thank you, Chair. Yes. Uh, a couple of things, if, if I may. Uh, if I come back to, I think Councillor David was that said the members are, are basically looking for a mechanism to allow those communities that want growth to have growth uh, and to constrain growth in those that don't want growth. 
Um, and, and I think that's quite a good summary of, of where where the discussion has, has got to. And I, and I suppose the point I'd make in response to that is I, I think what we've put forward in the working draft local plan seeks to achieve that by having the settlement hierarchy of those settlements that are sustainable where general growth can go and then having opportunities through neighborhood plans, community led developments, rural exception sites for those communities that want growth to have growth, but that growth to be tailored to their needs. So it's to meet a specific need of those communities. Um, to have that growth and for them to have greater control of that growth through their neighbor plan a community land trust or, or, or whatever mechanism they choose. I think the problem we have trying to do this through the local plan is that the evidence requirements for a local plan are so much higher than a neighborhood plan. We have to follow planning logic and evidence in the production of the local plan. So whether or not a community wants growth or not, unfortunately, isn't really the test. It's whether or not it's a sustainable location for growth. Are there suitable sites in that location? Can that growth be accommodated? Uh, that is what's going to be tested at a local plan examination. I'm not saying we shouldn't obviously engage our communities in this discussion and obviously the intention is to do that through consultation as we move forward to a draft plan, consult on that plan, take those views on board and then modify the plan into a publication draft of the plan. We are still at very early stages of plan production. This is about producing a plan to send out to consultation and obtain the community's views on uh, the proposals within it. Um, I, I, I fear uh, it, it would be difficult to, to engage communities too much at, at, at this stage. Having said that, we have been having neighbourhood planning workshops and uh, webinars with the neighbourhood planning groups to talk them through where work has got to and, and feed that into this. And we'll, we'll obviously continue to do so. Um, and I think that's an important part of the process. Um, but I think we have to bear in mind that the local plan is going to be rigidly tested at examination based on the evidence and the planning logic that has gone into the production of the policies within it, um, which is to some extent the case in neighbourhood plans, as, as Councillor Allen has said, but they're, they're not examined by planning inspectors. They're, they're examined by independent examiners who generally aren't planning inspectors. And the evidential weight uh, that's needed for a neighbourhood plan is, is, is much lower. Um, so I'm not sure, I mean, obviously we can prepare a report that details what neighbourhood plans in each of these communities has said. But as I said, we need to be led by the planning logic and the evidence. So if a plan in one community says they want growth and consider themselves sustainable and a plan in another says the opposite, I'm not sure that necessarily helps us if we're being led by the evidence and planning logic, if those two communities have got the same level of services and facilities. So I think we just need to be mindful of, of, of that would be my point. Um, the other point I wanted to make was in response to the motion about this up to 10% uh, increase. I, I, I don't, I'm perfectly happy to take that away as a sort of rule of thumb to guide the work that we're doing. And I think we have had regard to that, as you said, Chair, in terms of um, what we've put forward as our preferred options in terms of the working draft local plan. There are locations where we've got a huge number of options. Uh, I'll take Fenderton as an example, where you know potentially hundreds of homes have come forward as potential options in Fenderton, and yet we've moderated that down to a much smaller number so that that community isn't swamped. Uh, and obviously we'll continue to, to apply those, those principles. Um, and, and I'm happy to take sort of 10% as a sort of rule of thumb in terms of preparation. But again, coming back to the evidence that's needed to support a local plan, I don't think we could include a policy that says no more than 10% growth in tier four settlements. I, I don't see how that would be enforceable or how that's led by, by the evidence necessarily. Um, so it could do with some clarity as to how that's intended to apply. Is that intended to be a policy to go into the plan or is it a rule of thumb to help to guide production of the plan in terms of allocations and sites in those locations? Um, thank Thanks very much for that, Ed. Uh, really appreciated. Councillor Bay, apologies. I've just gone back through the, the proposed draft. It's not 60, it's 101. Um, so Mrs Shaw, can you take us to a vote, please? Thank you, Chair. Yes, the, I have two recommendations, but I just need to clarify for myself, recommendation one with Councillor Howe and Councillor Davey. The, the wording I have is to um, not extend 
tier four settlements at this time, but at in the um, resolution of committee back in February 2022 on the draft local working draft local plan, no four tier four settlements were actually agreed. So um, I'm just wondering whether Councillor Hound, Councillor Davy, would it agree to no extension to tier four settlement hierarchy above that proposed in the working draft local plan presented to strategic planning committee on the 8th of February 2022 as a clearer um, recommendation. I, I think I can quite happily say after that very long um, speech there. <laughs> Sorry. Mr. Mr. Shaw. Yes, I think that's fine. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Councillor Davies. Um, yep. Yes, yep. I'm happy with that. And then in line with Councillor, uh, with um, Mr. Freeman's request for clarity, um, the second recommendation I have is that not to expand tier four settlements by more than 10% above current numbers. Um, would you wish to amend that in any way or to, to clarify in that... Um, to develop a policy not to expand tier four settlements by more than 10%, which Mr. Freeman has clarified he would not recommend, or whether recommend to use as a rule of thumb not to expand tier four settlements by more than 10% above current numbers. Yeah, obviously, this is a lot more, you know, it would be good to have this debate first because this is this is more tricky. I, uh, I am of the mind where um, I think we need some ground rules. Um, and Mr. Freeman, I think, will understand why I want ground rules. But setting a hard line of 10% due to what Mr. Freeman has said, maybe not the best way without um, or maybe a change in wording from no more than 10% unless exceptional circumstances or infrastructure comes alongside, um, i.e. the neighbourhood plan or the community want it. Um, I think it's fairly easy to justify with a planning inspectorate because our villages are being swamped at present. And I don't think any of those in tier four in particular can take more than 10%. In fact, some of them will struggle to take 10%, let alone anything else. Um, so I think we need to be very mindful about what we're doing and how we do it. Um, uh, and actually, to be honest, if we want to split them um, and take the two separately, so deal with the first part first, and then have that bit of discussion on the second part, I'm quite happy to do that. It is Thank for you, you Chair, whether you... Sure. Yeah, can we take them separately, please? Thank you. Members, first recommendation, no extension to Tier 4 settlement hierarchy above that proposed in the working draft local plan presented to Strategic Planning Committee on the 8th of February 2022. If you're in support of the recommendation, please press your green tick. If you're against the recommendation, press your red cross, or if you wish to abstain, please raise your electronic hand. Okay, the vote is currently underway. Uh, so we have nine votes in support, one vote against and no abstentions. Therefore, Chair, do you wish to allow further debate on the second recommendation, which I have as not expand tier four settlements by more than 10% above current numbers unless supported by evidence? And I think there was something extra that Councillor Howe suggests that I didn't get a note of. I, well, I went slightly further, supported by evidence like the neighbourhood plan or with infrastructure attachments to it. Right. I. I don't think we need further debate. Councillor Bailey, a really quick point, if you can make it, please. Um, yes, I don't tend to speak for too long, but um, I, I would have thought that maybe we could say um, that, because we're always talking about modest growth, aren't we, for the um, service villages. So we could say that um, the, something like the committee um, acknowledges that um, for the purposes of preparing the local plan, um, modest growth represents no more than 10%. Thank you very much. Councillor Howe, are you happy to accept that? I'm more than happy to accept that. Thank you very much. Councillor Davey? Yes, that's fine with me too. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, you very much. For that. Councillor Bailey, over to you, Mrs Shaw. Therefore, members, please press your green tick if you're in support of that subsequent recommendation. Press your red cross if you're against that recommendation or raise your electronic hand to indicate you're abstaining from the vote. 
Okay, the, uh, the vote is currently underway. So we have, um, we've got one abstention and nine votes in support and no votes against. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that. Um, I think we'll take a short break now. So if we can take a five minute break and we'll reconvene at quarter past, please. I think we're ready to resume, Wendy. Give poor Wendy chance or Wendy's back. She's got a headset on now. I think we're ready to, to start again, Wendy. Thank you. So welcome back everyone. We move to agenda item nine, which is the call for sites and it's over to Ed Freeman to present its report, please. Uh, thank you, Chair. So, so members will recall um, 
at I think it was the previous meeting to this, um, requesting that we undertake a, a, a further call for sites uh, to try and identify additional land that may be uh, considered for site allocation through the Emerging New Local Plan. Um, so this report um, sort of seeks to set out uh, how we would go about doing that and the uh, key areas and sites that we would be targeting, uh, given that members were in favour of a targeted approach rather than a, a sort of blanket uh, request as we've done in the past across the whole of the district. So uh, section two of the report talks about uh, some of the key targeted areas we would uh, envisage through the call for sites. Um, some of these are informed by members discussion at last meeting so there was particular discussion I think about um, the uh, settlement hierarchy in tiers one to four within the hierarchy, uh, brownfield sites, regeneration opportunities, intensification of existing sites where uh, they, they perhaps maximise um, densities and uh, make more efficient use of those sites. Um, and then there are other options that uh, I think have come through from, from, from officers' work more widely in terms of um, whether there are further sites options available within the western side of, of the district, opportunities for, for small-scale housing sites. So one of the things that's uh, an expectation in national policy is that we allocate more small-scale housing sites. Uh, through the new local plan, this is part of the government's move to encourage small and medium sized uh, builders back into the, the, the market. Um, and, and we're fairly short in terms of, of those small scale sites at the moment. Um, we're fairly short on employment sites at the moment. Um, obviously, uh, we're still gathering evidence in terms of, of needs for the economic development needs assessment, but we would envisage there obviously being a need for employment sites. And I think members have made reference in discussions about locations where potentially more employment sites are needed to make settlements more uh, sustainable and, and promote self-containment. Um, so we're keen to, to, to have more employment sites coming forward and gypsy and traveller sites is a regular problem in terms of a lack of uh, land coming forward to accommodate the needs of the gypsy and traveller community, um, as has been identified and was mentioned by Councillor Miller earlier. Um, it, it is a problem in terms of bringing those sites forwards and unfortunately I don't have a magic solution to uh, encourage landowners to bring sites forward for gypsy and traveller use. Uh, obviously, uh, one option available to us is to do as we've done in the Cranbrook plan, uh, where on large scale housing sites, we've required developers fundamentally to set aside some land to meet the needs of gypsies and travellers in that location. So that might be an option if there are insufficient gypsy and traveller sites uh, being put forward by landowners willing to accommodate them on their land. Um, and then section three of the port report looks at engagement and how we would plan to undertake uh, that. So um, lots of opportunities here in terms of press releases, media coverage. coverage. I think members were very keen that we contacted parish and town councils. Uh, so we see that as an opportunity to uh, encourage them to put forward sites uh, with the caveat that they do need to ensure that they've uh, got the support of the landowner. Um, because it is key that any sites coming forward are viable, are available, uh, and, and obviously uh, a willing landowner is a key component of that. Um, contacting public bodies, so trying to use contacts through one public estate uh, and other means to engage with them. Chambers of Commerce and business owners, uh, and um, groups representing uh, large landowners such as National Farmers Union and Country Land and Business Association seem like good opportunities to engage and try and encourage sites to, to come forward in those locations. Uh, and then section four talks about the timetabling for that. The intention would really be to, to get that underway as soon as we possibly can uh, and run that for, for six weeks. Uh, and then we would have to reconvene the HELAR panel to consider any additional sites that have come forward uh, through that route. Um, and feed that through into an, an addendum to to the final HELAR to the HELAR report to then produce a final HELAR report. Um, and then there's a short section at the end about resources. Obviously, this does have some resource implications uh, in terms of the work that would be involved. Um, I think we had envisaged potentially doing further call for sites alongside the draft plan. Um, so this is sort of bringing this uh, forward, I suppose, for, from that option. Um, 
so uh, I'm proposing there to kind of bring regular updates to members in terms of the timetable and the implications of that. I think it's difficult to quantify the resource implications because it does largely depend on how many sites, additional sites come forward and then have to be considered by officers in the HELAR panel. Um, so the recommendations are uh, that the committee are asked to endorse the proposal for further call for sites to support production of the housing and employment land availability assessment and that they delegate authority to uh, myself as service lead planning strategy and development management to undertake this work. Thank you, Chair. Thanks very much. Uh, so again, we start outside the committee and Councillor Faithful will come to you, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, to me, one thing with we're always talking about houses all the time and employment is really important and employment is important in rural communities as much as anywhere else. Um, shall I declare a personal interest? I did agricultural engineering after I left school. And one of the things we had to do was design our own workshop. And surely you want to have your agricultural mechanics workshop where the agriculture is. So you want to be out with the farming community and they, you know, there's a whole stack of spin-off employment off agriculture and surely they should be in as part of that community and not have to be stuck in the middle of Honiton or somewhere like that. Um, and going back on to Councillor Giles' comments right at the start, I really think the parishes should be properly included in the uh, discussion about the need for housing in their communities. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Councillor Faithful. Councillor Bailey, we come to you, please. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> yes, um, I agree with doing a call for sites. Um, I think we need to be clear that, first of all, the emphasis in terms of the hierarchy of settlements um, needs to me means that we need to really focus on the top uh, upper tiers of the hierarchy of settlements rather than, uh, and I think that needs to be spelt out quite clearly in the call for sites. Um, and I also think that where right, you might end up with more, even more sites um, in existing settlements. So some settlements have got no um, uh, sites and some have got masses. So I would suggest that you don't spend officers time calling for more sites where you've already got plenty and focus instead specifically on the ones where uh, you haven't got any sites. So that's the second thing I would say. Um, I completely agree uh, about the parish council. So I think that if you're going to be, I think they need to be properly engaged. Otherwise, I think there's going to be um, real uh, pushback later on. And um, uh, so I would be wanting to ask them, ask them for their input and ask them if they can identify any sites and also asking if they've got any comments. I mean, we've, you know, we've published our local plan can we not um, ask for if they've got any comments on the ones that we've put forward already? So that's my third point. And then my fourth point is, and this is not specifically on uh, the uh, call for site, but I am concerned that, that we haven't done a strate strategic brown build site. Um, I know we've done urban, urban capacity site, but we haven't done a strategic brown field site. I know that through GESP, um, Exeter City Council did that, and they evaluated particularly car parks um, for potential housing. But, you know, we're, we're very quick to say that we can't accommodate any houses within our, you know, our settlements. And actually, if you look at the total number of houses that have been um, uh, allocated to our top tier uh, settlements, um, actually, in comparison with the villages, um, they're, they're, there's not that many allocations. And I think that, you know, we're duty bound if we're trying to um, have sustainable development, um, that we actually make sure that we know what we could be doing in those town centres. And I know that that's more difficult for developers than having a lovely green field that we can uh, that could be built on. But also East Devon obviously has assets in all those town centres 
And I, I don't recall ever through this whole local plan process having explored the extent to which um, though, you know, any of those could accommodate um, uh, any additional housing. And I think that that, I think it would be very regrettable if we carry on looking at all our green fields without properly examining that. And I know that people might say, well, that will take a long time and, you know, develop, you know, we've got our five year land supply and, and everything. But I think it's a really, really important thing to do. So I'd like to propose, please, that um, we um, and I know Ed Freeman probably will think, oh, no, not another, not another, not another study or not another sur <laughs> survey. But I think this is really, really important. So I'd like to propose um, that we actually um, add uh, commission a strategic Bramfield site study in a similar way that Exeter City Council did um, as part of GESP. So that's what I've got to say. Thank you. Thanks very much, Councillor Bailey. Ed, do you have anything you wish to come back on? Um, thank you, Chair. I'd, I'd have to do some research into what Exeter have done differently to us. My, my recollection through GESP was that we all did an urban capacity study. Um, so I'm not sure what um, it's, it's, we are it's checking. It was done by LDA and it was called a strategic brownfield site study. Thank you. OK, uh, I would have to do some research into that and see what that captured that our urban capacity study didn't. Um, I, I certainly accept we need to go back through the urban capacity study and look at what sites uh, were identified, what potential they have. task force in terms of looking at sites that she may be able to bring forward and other sites the council may own uh, that haven't been previously put forward and obviously I see this as an opportunity for them to put sites forward for us to to assess through this process so we'll join up with colleagues to try and make that that happen uh, as, as well as part of this. Um, in, in terms of other comments uh, Councillor Mayley's made, um, certainly I think the focus would be on the upper tiers of the hierarchy. Um, that's not to say that if sites are put forward in the lower tiers that we, we wouldn't, uh, I think we would still have to accept them and, and consider them. Uh, and likewise, in terms of further sites coming forward in locations where, where we have lots of sites already, there's obviously the opportunity where better sites may come forward. Um, or indeed, I think we need to, to treat everyone fairly. So if further uh, sites are com coming forward, regardless of whether they're in the locations we necessarily want them or need them, we will, I think we would still have to take them into the process and consider them um, to ensure that all landowners have, have had a fair hearing through, through this process and we've considered all options. Um, I think this is really about where we, we target in terms of who we're contacting uh, and, and being clear about um, where we particularly want to target the, the call for sites. But ultimately, I think if we get any sites coming forward from anywhere in the district, we will have to take them into the process for this to be a fair process um, uh, for, for everyone involved. Um, I think the other point was made about getting comments from town and parish councils on on sites. Um, I, I think as there's a there's a sort of trend coming through this meeting in terms of engagement with town and parishes and neighbourhood planning process, and we perhaps need to give some thought to how we do that in, in terms of this process. Um, uh, as I say, I think we are still at a very early stage in this uh, process, and there will be ample opportunities for engagement and consultation later in the process. Uh, when, when we have a draft plan and, and clarity about exactly what, what, what members want to bring forward in this plan. Um, and um, so I do see that as an important part of this process. I just question whether or not now would be, be the time to do that. Thank you, Chair. Thanks very much for that, Ed. Councillor Allen, we, we move to you now, please. Thank you, Ed, and thank you, Dan. Um, in all of this, I'm very conscious of the fact that what we're doing is creating a plan which will have an effect for 30 or 40 years and potentially a century ahead because you don't uh, tend to dig up houses once you've established a settlement, it's established. So my concern is that we get it right now, if the proposal for Ottery St. Mary doesn't go ahead and we need another 1,500 houses there, 
And if the proposal doesn't go ahead for a new uh, community of between two and a half and rising up to 8,000 people in the West End, then what else happens? So I propose a, a third recommendation, which is that in evaluating the proposed sites, officers should not presume that the development of a large new West End community will be approved. I do believe we have to have contingency views. It doesn't mean that we're going to approve anything, but it does mean that when officers are looking at this situation, we shouldn't go ramble, ramping on with an assumption that may not be either viable from an infrastructure viewpoint or acceptable uh, as, as a planning idea. So that's that's a proposal. Thank you, Chair. Thanks very much for that, Councillor Allen. Does that warrant a second from anyone? Yeah, I, I don't have a problem with that. I think he's made, Councillor Allen's made a good point. Yep. Thanks very much, Councillor Skinner. You can lead in to your second speech Thank as you. well. Thank you. And 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 I and I and I think the call for sites, I think Ed again is playing a bit of a steam ray, but um some of it is always sort of blatantly obvious um in some respects, and that is that um oh, my screen's gone black. Is that me? Am I black or uh, can you hear me? We can hear you, Councillor Skinner, yeah. Oh, sorry. OK, the screen's gone black. Um, <clears throat> ah, you're back again, Dan. Um, yeah, so so it's, so I just I just wondering the call for sites. It has to be done on an even even handedly, as, as, as Ed suggested, any sites that come in. Uh, I'm not really uh, if you're going to have a call for sites, going for a, a hierarchy of sites and some of not the other sites. Um, I, I'm not for that. A call for sites is we'd need some extra land and we need to see what comes and then we can filter through the options. All that the call for sites is doing is it's giving us the ability as a local authority to understand that those people that are put into the call for sites are prepared to give their land up and don't take it as an acceptance that just anybody does give the land up because there are many people who don't want to give their land up for anything. Thank you. They're just happy with what they've got. So I think that's one point. Um, the second point um, Councillor Bailey spoke about was the uh, way in which um, Exeter had done their report by the LDA to, to signify sites that we've got. What we've got to be careful of is the one thing that we have got is a shortage of employment land. And if we go out looking at all these brainfield sites to fill up with employment land, all we're doing is exasperating the issue that we have in hand. And that is, is it's not just about housing. It is called the um, housing and employment land availability process. So um, I'm, I'm a little bit concerned about where that is, almost like as if there's a, uh, a thought process that we mustn't go on green land. Well, we're not going to achieve what we've got to achieve without looking at greenfield sites, I'm afraid. So as much as I accept what's been said in a principle, it is only in principle because we have to get to the point of where we need to be. And that is having enough land, availability of land. So the call for sites for me needs to be very even handed from, from wherever they come. Thank you. Thanks very much, Councillor Skinner. Uh, and so we move to Councillor Lawrence for his maiden speech. Over to you, Councillor Lawrence. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just want to put in something here. There, there seems to be a sort of a reticence amongst some members about the expansion of villages and everything else and the control. And, and, and Councillor Howe made a, a, a very good statement about trying to limit where this development would take place. And I think it's the council that are at fault in the past for, for making this um, problem. Because as an example, with Wimple, um, we were supposed to have a consultation. Um, we, we had a consultation on uh, a, a, a gypsy and traveler site, which was part of Cranbrook. Where was it built? In Wimple. And what happened? Everybody said, we don't want it. And what happened? This is where it's gonna go, in Wimple. So these consultations 
people they, they don't take any notice so we've got to set the ground rules now um, in order to follow through in the future because if we don't set the ground rules now um, people aren't going to take any notice and, and, and it's, it's just going to happen and we do have to limit um, the amount of, of, of building um, on, on, on our villages and preserve their future um, as, as, as they have done in the past. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Lawrence. Councillor Arno, over to you, please. Thank you, Chair. Uh, yes, I, I think I just want to bring us back to the recommendations we've got, number one and number two, uh, which I'm happy with. Um, I think, sadly, I wouldn't be able to support the, the proposed number three because it seems to me as if it's sort of slightly relitigating this issue of whether there's going to be a, a settlement in the west end of the district. And, and I kind of feel as if we've done that on a previous agenda item. So I, I, with respect to the proposal, the genuine is it, but I'm sure he knows I wouldn't be able to support that, but happy to support the, uh, happy even to move the first two, Chair, if that's any help to you. Thank you. Thanks very much, Councillor Arnold. Councillor Bailey, over to you, please. Yes, yeah, so I was just going to say the same point um, about uh, that Councillor Arnold said. I was a bit worried about uh, Councillor Allen's amendment, that that was kind of kind of going against what we've already agreed at this, uh, earlier on. Um, and I just wanted to come back on um, uh, Councillor Skinner's point that I don't think I don't think we can preemptively decide what a, um, um, a strategic brownfield site study would say. Um, I mean, Exeter, you know, they've they've um, reinvigorated many parts of their town um, uh, to produce housing without uh, necessarily reducing any employment capacity. And I think that's the whole point of doing of commissioning a study that you would know, you would find out how much. <clears throat> Um, you know, you, you would find out what's possible. And I think um, we should try and do that. So I, I don't know whether I can add that as a proposal because I'm not sure what the status is of the proposal, but I hope that we could do that. Thank you. So what I'm just going to check with Mrs Shaw, we've had a proposal on the table. Technically, what Councillor Arnott and Councillor Betty is putting forward is an amendment to the amended proposal from what's written in the report. So we just take that as an amendment, Mr. Shaw, is that correct? Moment. Point of order, Chair. Councillor no. Allen, Allen, I'm just trying to take legal advice here. It's not a point of order. Mr. Shaw. It is, because it's, uh, it's a negating amendment. If, if, if I could, sure. if I could sure. clarify, yep. Councillor Allen's motion was purely to have in evaluating proposed sites, officers should not presume a large new community to West End will be approved. He did not, he and Councillor Skinner did not move the first and second recommendations. Um, the first and the then Councillor Arnott has moved, but it hasn't been seconded, the first and second recommendations. So therefore, Councillor Allen's motion and Councillor Skinner's motion is the only motion that has been seconded at this time. Okay, so should I be seeking a, a second from Councillor Arnold as an amendment or should we just I, prefer, I, we, uh, we take a vote on the initial? Councillor Allen, I'm thought, just trying to I, get the legal advice here. Just bear with me. Mrs. Shaw. So I, I thought second, I proposed one and two. No, Councillor Allen, you hadn't. Well, Therefore, then I'll second Arnold. Uh, Councillor Arnott. Okay. Um, I'm not quite sure. Uh, I think the best route would be to um, have all um, rec current recommendations withdrawn and we ask for a clear recommendation that is seconded going forward because Council Councillor Arnott's recommendation was only for in relation to the first and second recommendations in the papers. It did not include the third recommendation, which Councillor Allen wanted. Okay. Could I could I suggest something, Chair? Of course, Councillor Allen. Uh, Councillor no. Skinner. Skinner. Could I could I suggest that Councillor Allen, as he agrees with Councillor Arnott, that if Councillor Allen 
votes puts in one and two and the amendment, which is three, because that's the bit they wanted to do. And then we vote on that. And if members aren't happy with that, because they're not happy with three, they will vote against it. And then there could be a recommendation to put forward one and two. That's exactly what I was just about to come to. Councillor Skinner, thank you very much. So can we stick with Councillor Allen proposing uh, one, two and the three that he has? Yep. Councillor Skinner, you're happy to second that? Yep. Yep. Fantastic. So we have a motion on the table. Yeah. Councillor Arnold, at this time, we'll take, if it falls, we'll come to yours uh, yep. Yep. afterwards. Councillor Howe, we'll come to you and then we'll go to sum up. Thank you very much. I just need to, I suppose, correct, um, hopefully um, uh, enlighten, I suppose, one way or another. We don't have to have employment sites devoid of housing. Um, live work units, brilliant things that they are, work very well in a lot of areas. So you have the housing with the work unit. And let's face it, with the way petrol, diesel and fuel, electricity and everything else is going, the ability to walk to your work right next door or below you seems like a damn good idea at this minute in time. And the other statement that was made that I do have an issue with is we don't have to use greenfield sites at all. There are plenty of communities worldwide that ban the use of greenfield sites. And they stick everything on their brownfield sites they have and they combine employment and housing together not in live work units particularly but in tall buildings and everything else that they do so this assumption that we have to have groundfield great greenfield sites is wrong we do have to in this local plan but the future we should be moving away from any use of greenfield sites and i hope because of the environment we do eventually um, but I just need to point those two things out because they were just beginning to annoy me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Howe. Mrs Shaw, can you please take us to a vote, please? Yes, members. Therefore, before you is recommendation one, endorse the proposal for further call for sites to support production of housing and employment land availability assessment. Secondly, delegate authority to the service lead planning strategy and development management to undertake this work. And thirdly, in evaluating the proposed sites, officers should not presume a large new community to the West End will be approved. Please press your green tick. Uh, if you're in Chair, it's conventional that uh, the proposer gets to sum up. Would you mind if I just very briefly do that? I don't want to be That's misunderstood. Okay, no problem. Thank you. Um, in, in proposing point three, I don't want to say that I'm against the new town that's being proposed. That's not the point. The point is that we shouldn't presume it's possible and that in taking on board the new proposed sites, at least we have an open mind as to where we then are presented with sites. Don't let me get misunderstood here, please. It's purely a contingency. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Allen. Mr. Shaw, uh, I don't think we need to take it. Can we just take it to a vote, members? We have it in front of us. Green ticks for yes, red ticks for no. Abstain with that, your hand up, please. Okay, the vote is currently underway. So we have eight votes in support, four votes against, no abstentions. Thank you very much, that's passed. Um, we move to the last agenda item of the day, and that is the Mid-Devon Issues Consultation. And over to you again, Ed Freeman. I'm sorry, Chair. I do note that Councillor Haywood has returned into the meeting. I wonder if he could make his declarations of interest that he wasn't able to earlier in the meeting. Yes, of course. Mr. I'll be more than happy to, none to declare. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. Mr Freeman, over to you. Uh, thank you, Chair. So um, we've been consulted by uh, Mid-Devon District Council on their local plan issues consultation, which is the first stage of consultation on a new local plan for Mid-Devon. So this is 
uh, akin, I suppose, to the consultation that we carried out on our own local plan at the start of last year. Members will recall on just sort of setting out that we were looking to produce a new local plan, uh, some of the issues we would be looking to address and highlighting uh, various issues that um, would would be responded to through through that plan and uh, this is Mid-Devon doing a, a, a similar thing so as you can see in paragraph 1.2 in the report we sort of set out some of the headlines in terms of their housing numbers uh, their general employment strategy some of their key growth areas around Clumpton, Calm Garden Village and Junction 27 of the M5 um, much of which are, are developments of proposals that are already in their, their now adopted uh, local plan uh, and were consulted on at that time. Uh, so there's uh, it's, it's early days in, in terms of their plan, uh, so relatively few issues to pick up on in terms of uh, duty to cooperate and cross-boundary issues. Um, but we set out um, a response at paragraph 2.2 .2 in the report, um, just highlighting some of the issues we've picked up on that um, we would hope to, to work with them on uh, and cooperate with them in, in the future as their plan progresses. Uh, would ask members to agree that as as our response to their consultation. Thank you, Chair. Thanks very much, Ed. I don't see any members wishing to speak at this time. Um, wholeheartedly agree with all the comments, uh, the proposed comments and response made. Um, I'm happy to move that from the Chair. Councillor Skinner, you wish to comment? You're currently on mute. Yeah, sorry, sorry, I was late in my putting my hand up. Um, yes, I mean the, the the working with Mid Devon is absolutely vital as long as as, as it is with with Exeter and with uh, Teambridge in the same way. I was obviously going for a a, a calm garden village um, that is going to uh, result in uh, quite a large development for them in the Columpton area. Um, I'd very much like to see. And I will look up and read more of what it is they want to do, because I think I'm really interested in knowing that the doors are open for us to have discussions with Columpton, because some of the stuff that's going to happen in Columpton is obviously the employment space. And let's get a figure that I learned when I was, when I was in the job, which came out, is that Columpton's working population, 80% of them, 80% of Columpton's working population work in Exeter. That's a massive amount of people that work in Exeter from a neighboring authority. That not only does it land obviously in Exeter, they also work just in our patch as well. So it's a large number of people. So working, the due diligence of working with cooperatively with our local authorities or neighboring local authorities is absolutely paramount. And I just, I just wanted to make that point. I think I've said enough, thank you. Thanks very much, Councillor Skinner. Councillor Howe, over to you. Well, mine's a strange one because it's not about this report, but it is um, regarding a interest because I am a director for a company in Columpton, an industrial uh, company, um, and I just want to make sure I don't have to declare anything. Do I? You know, I know it's cross-border and all the rest of it, but for clarity and sanity, if you get my meaning, this is sure. Do I need to declare anything or not, shall we say? The report relates to our response to back to them. So I would suggest a personal interest sh should be declared. In that case, uh, Wendy, if you don't mind, if I could add a personal interest to this one, please. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, so no further speakers. I've proposed it from the chair. Uh, it doesn't require a second. So Mr. Shaw, can you take us to something up, please? Thank you, members. Your, the motion is to endorse the re proposed response to this report and delegate authority service lead planning strategy and development management to submit comments accordingly. Please press your green tick if you're in support of that recommendation, press your red cross if you're against the recommendation or raise your electronic hand if you wish to indicate you're abstaining. I can advise there's 12 votes in support, no votes against and no abstentions. Thank you very much, Wendy, and thank you very much, Mr Shaw. Um, so with that, that brings our meeting to an end. I'd like to thank everyone, including the members of the public, for their attendance. Members, can I remind you that until the Democratic Service team confirm the live streaming and recording is stopped, you can be seen and heard and any comments may be recorded.
Thank you very much. Chair, are you still on? Still here, yeah. Just waiting for the live stream to stop. <laughs>